dismantling of Iraq. Topics include last month's Blackwater shootings and Iraq government corruption. Henry Waxman chairs this House Oversight Committee hearing. It's three hours. Committee will please come to order. We have uh, very tight time constraints this morning, so I'll make a very few brief opening comments, and we'll have uh, Mr. Davis make his comments as well. I want to begin by thanking Secretary Rice for being here today. I know she had to adjust her schedule to uh, accommodate uh, this opportunity for our, hear our hearing. The Iraq War is our nation's top foreign policy priority. It has also meant extraordinary sacrifice for our troops and their families. Over 3,800 of our soldiers have been killed and another 28,000 have been wounded. And we have already spent over $450 billion on the war. For most of this year, Congress has focused its attention on assessing the military surge. Much less attention has been devoted to evaluating the political progress in Iraq. But almost every expert agrees that political reconciliation is the key to achieving lasting peace in Iraq. As General Petraeus has observed, quote, there is no military solution to the problem like that in Iraq. I think that's exactly right, and that's why it's so important to assess what the State Department is doing in Iraq and to understand the impacts that corruption, mismanagement, and lax oversight are having on our mission. Beginning in July, our committee has held a series of hearings to examine these issues. We have held hearings on the Iraq Embassy, Blackwater, and corruption in the Iraqi ministries. These hearings and our investigation have raised important questions. Is the Maliki government too corrupt to succeed? Have the reckless actions of private contractors like Blackwater turned Iraqis against us? Why did the State Department select a Kuwaiti company under investigation for kickbacks and bribery to build the largest embassy in the world? And can the State Department account for over a billion dollars spent on a contract to train the Iraqi police? The executive office with direct responsibility over these issues is the State Department, and the official most responsible is, for them is Secretary Rice. The quality and effectiveness of her actions in Iraq and the State Department's management are a matter of urgent national concern, and that is the focus of today's hearing. This week, President Bush asked the American people to spend another $46 billion in Iraq. The President also is continuing to ask our bravest Americans to risk their lives there. As Congress evaluates these requests, we need to know what the State Department is doing to combat corruption in Iraq. We, didn't, we need to know whether the State Department is capable of real oversight over Blackwater and other government contractors, and most of all, we need to know whether the mistakes of the State Department have jeopardized any chance for political success in Iraq. Mr. Davis, I recognize you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Rice, uh, welcome. Your testimony today will give uh, much needed perspective and context to the complex oversight issues being pursued by this committee. Uh, we appreciate your being here. The high-level, results-oriented outlook you bring to our discussions has been missed by those of us who want to fix problems, not just fix blame. So far, our hearings on Iraq have thoroughly and loudly described alleged mismanagement, failures, and well-known challenges, but have led to no serious discussion about how to repair faulty programs or disjointed processes. Pursuing only half of our mandate under House rules, it has been all oversight, no reform. I hope our dialogue today will begin to right that imbalance. Effective State Department operations in Iraq and throughout the Middle East are critical to our national security and our global strategic objectives. Military skill and valor open the door, but the path to victory in Iraq, however you define that term, can only be secured through diplomatic and political dexterity in a dangerous and volatile environment. 
So it is essential that legitimate questions about State's operational strength and agility receive sustained attention at the highest levels of the Department. With the Secretary's presence here today, there should be no question that that is the case. Regarding the specific issues before us, the use of private security contractors, the coordination of anti-corruption assistance, construction of the embassy compound in Baghdad, and broader efforts to foster reconstruction and political compromise in Iraq, Secretary Rice and the Department have been proactive in identifying issues, addressing problems, improving performance, and increasing accountability. Today we need to hear more about those initiatives. And we need to learn what the Department needs from this Committee and this Congress to protect and empower America's diplomatic forces in Iraq. Yesterday, the Department released a report by a special panel Secretary Rice appointed to review policies and practices governing uh, personal protective services. The steps recommended should improve coordination and management of essential uh, security functions in connection with critical diplomatic activities. But more will be needed and more must be done as we look forward to hearing from the Secretary how the Department plans to keep that role of security contractors more closely aligned with our larger goals in Iraq. Reports of construction problems and delays at the new embassy compound in Baghdad ha uh, have to cause concerns, but worries about cost overruns should not be among them. The initial $592 million project was constructed under a fixed price contract, and any work required to fix deficiencies or meet specifications will be completed at the contractor's expense. The decision to expand what was already the largest U.S. Embassy in the world raises separate fiscal and policy questions that I am sure the Secretary is prepared to address. Regarding corruption, it has to be conceded that no amount of hand-wringing or feigned indignation here can obscure the hard truth the United States did not bring corruption to Iraq and it won't stop when we leave. Focusing on the extent of corruption rather than the effect of anti-corruption efforts betrays a desire to publicize corruption, not to help fix it. Efforts to refocus and re-energize anti-corruption programs in Iraq are underway and we look forward to hearing more about them. Yesterday, with characteristic tact and understatement, the Secretary described the Foreign Affairs Committee the issue she was invited here to discuss as management challenges. But we have to acknowledge there are more than that. We should have no illusions about the subtext of these hearings. Unable to reverse course, <clears throat> the Democratic strategy seems to be to drill enough small holes in the bottom of the boat to sink the entire Iraqi enterprise while still claiming undying support for the crew about to drown. As that strategy unfolds, we should not underestimate the corrosive impact on our diplomatic standing and the morale of those pursuing U.S. goals in Iraq when we gratuitously flog these problems publicly without constructive solutions. Madam Secretary, you bring a productive, forward-looking perspective to our discussion today. We thank you for your continued cooperation in the oversight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis, for your statement. We are going to go right to the Secretary. Uh, Madam Secretary, it is the practice of this committee to put all witnesses under oath, so I would like to ask you to stand and raise your right hand, if you would. Yes. You uh, solemn, solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. The record will reflect that you answered in the affirmative. Uh, we are pleased to have you. Uh, your prepared statement will be made part of the record in its entirety. Because of the time constraints uh, placed upon the committee, uh, we are going to ask you to limit your oral presentation to no more than five minutes. There will be a, a little uh, clock in front of you. Uh, when there is uh, 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 one minute left, it will turn yellow, and then when the time is up, it will turn red. There is a button on the base of the mic, so be sure it is pressed in so that we will know it is working and pull it as close to you as you feel you need to. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman Waxman. Thank you, Representative Davis, and thank I don't you, members th of I don't the committee. Is mic it not is working? On. Is it working? Hello. Yeah. Hello. All right, good. Chairman Waxman, or Representative Davis, members of the committee, thank you very much. And I hope, um, Chairman Waxman, I won't need the entire five minutes because I'm really here to answer your questions. Um, I want to just make a few uh, opening contextual points, uh, nonetheless. And uh, that is to underscore the importance of success uh, in Iraq for American foreign policy and indeed for our security and for that of uh, the world as a whole. I also want to uh, associate myself with something that you have said, which is that uh, the success of our political efforts in Iraq, the success of what civilians bring to the fight, is absolutely crucial. And I want to acknowledge <coughs> the hard work of the men and women of the State Department, our Foreign Service, 
uh, our civil service, our foreign service nationals, and our contractors who are playing an essential role in carrying out our policies in Iraq, and people who, frankly, are in great danger. They are away from uh, home, they are away from friends, they are away from families, as our military uh, is as well. And yet they serve uh, shoulder to shoulder with our military, some of them actually embedded with uh, brigade command teams, um, dodging IEDs, uh, just as our military uh, people do. Uh, they serve in an embassy in which uh, they are subject to indirect fire. Uh, they are operating in perhaps the most complex circumstances uh, that we have faced as a Department of State, and they do it with valor, they do it with dedication, they do it with great patriotism, and uh, everything that we say today uh, should remember that, because uh, these are people uh, for whom we want to give the very best support because they are giving it all uh, to their nation. I want to note, too, that it's a complex and difficult operating environment in Iraq. This is a country that is, returning, uh, that is recovering from decades of tyranny. It is recovering from uh, United Nations sanctions under the Oil for Food program that, frankly, warped the economy and warped the society. Uh, it is a country uh, that didn't even have a functioning banking system, something that we are still uh, trying to help them establish. Uh, we are trying through our programs to help them find skilled labor, skilled personnel, so that they can establish the institutions of governance, the institutions of management that, frankly, after our long experience, we simply take for granted. These are difficult tasks in the best of circumstances. I think if you read World Bank reports or other reports about trying to bring uh, governance and management capability to young states, you will find that it is always hard. It is extremely hard when you are working in what is essentially a wartime environment. And so um, I just want to acknowledge the very hard work and the dedication of our people. And uh, I'm now prepared to take your questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll proceed with uh, 10 minutes on each side, controlled by the chair and then controlled by Mr. Davis. Then we'll move to five minutes. And the chair will recognize himself. Uh, Secretary Rice, one of my concerns as we look at Iraq is is that uh, our troops are sacrificing their lives, our nation is spending hundreds of billions of dollars to prop up a, re a regime in Iraq that looks like it is fundamentally corrupt. Uh, our committee held a hearing on the corruption in Iraq. Uh, and at this hearing, we heard from Judge Rodi Hamza al Rodi. He, uh, he told us some important things at that hearing. He was appointed uh, as the commissioner of the Iraq. Uh, Commission on Public Integrity by Amp Ambassador Paul Bremer and Stuart Bowen, the Special in Je Inspector General in Iraq, had nothing but high praise for him, as did um, Ambas Ambassador Lawrence Butler from your State Department. They paid tribute to his courage and his tenacity, and they said that his departure from the scene in Iraq was a, a real blow. At that hearing, Judge Roddy described a, a rising epidemic of corruption inside the Maliki government that is even funding the insurgency and undermining our, uh, any efforts of political reconciliation. He told us, and I quote, corruption in Iraq today is rampant across the government, costing tens of billions of dollars and has infec infected virtually every agency and ministry, including some of the most powerful officials in Iraq, end quote. I assume you are aware, Secretary Rice, that Judge Roddy told us his investigators had identified an enormous sum, $18 billion, that corrupt Iraqi officials have stolen. Are you aware of that? I'm aware of Judge Roddy's uh, testimony to you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. He also told us that 31 people on his staff were brutally assassinated when they tried to investigate these corrupt officials. Were you aware of that? I'm aware of his testimony to you, Mr. Chairman. And he um, testified that the family members of another 12 of his staff were tortured and murdered. Are you, were you aware of that? Uh, again, I'm aware of his testimony okay. to you. These are the Iraqis who are, who are doing exactly what we asked them to do. They're trying to create a functioning government and democracy in Iraq, but they're not the Iraqis running the government. 
In fact, Judge Roddy and his family have been driven out of Iraq and have been granted humanitarian parole in the United States. Judge Roddy raised specific concerns about the integrity of Iraq Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki. He told this committee that Prime Minister Maliki used secret orders to stop investigations of corruption of top Iraqi ministers, including al-Maliki's own cousin, Sal Salam al-Maliki, the former Minister of Transportation. Do you know whether this is true? Did Prime Minister Maliki intervene to obstruct a corruption investigation of his cousin, the Transportation Minister? Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me say that uh, some of the questions that you're asking may indeed get into areas uh, in which there are uh, concerns about the exposure of sources. Uh, I don't want you to expose any sources. Yes. I'm just asking you whether you're aware uh, that Prime Minister Maliki intervened to obstruct a corruption investigation of his cousin, the Transportation Minister. Uh, let me say that everything that has been brought to the attention of either various boards in Iraq or to our people has, is being investigated. So you're aware that of this allegation and you're aware uh, that this... I am not personally following every allegation uh, of corruption in Iraq, uh, Mr. Chairman, but I am certain that we are uh, tracking these uh, allegations of, invest of uh, corruption because no one is more concerned about allegations of corruption in Iraq. No one is more concerned about what is, in fact, a pervasive problem of corruption uh, than, than we are. Well, you're the Secretary of State. You're not tracking every incident of allegations of corruption, but this is an allegation that the Prime Minister al-Maliki has obstructed an investigation of his cousin, the Transportation Minister. Uh, and we've got thousands of Americans who are dying there. We're spending hundreds of billions of dollars in Iraq to prop up this government. And let me just ask you this question again. Do you, do you know whether Prime Minister obstructed Maliki obstructed a corruption investigation involving his cousin, the Transportation Mr. Minister? Mr. Chairman, we pull, pull up your microphone. Every, we investigate allegations of this kind because we, more than anyone, are concerned about corruption in Iraq and certainly would be concerned with an allegation of this kind. But I can't comment uh, on this specific allegation. I don't want to do so uh, without reviewing uh, precisely what you're talking about. Well, you're investigating, and this has been a charge that's been around for a while. The question is, what do you know? Do you know whether the, the, there's uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I am When will your investigation be complete? Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'm overseeing uh, a very large organization, and we are determined to look at allegations of corruption, the ones that you are talking about, the ones that we have found. Uh, we have many, many hundreds of documents hundreds of reports of uh, corruption. We investigate them all, but nothing is going to be gained by speaking prematurely about allegations uh, without fully investigating them. Well, this is a big deal. This is the prime minister of the country. I agree it's with a, you. It's, it's his big country, deal. We're, his government that we're propping up with the lives of our soldiers and the billions of dollars of our taxpayers' money. And uh, this is not a minor accusation. Now, uh, let me ask you about something well, else. Mr. Chairman, precisely because it's not a minor allegation, I think it is worth uh, giving the time to it to fully investigate it before discussing it. Judge uh, Roddy gave the committee copies of secret orders from Prime Minister Maliki's deputy. And I have the secret orders, and we've extended to a copy to you. Uh, these orders say that the Iraqi Commission on Public Integrity cannot refer for criminal prosecution the Iraqi president, the Council of Ministers, or any current or former ministers without the Prime Minister's permission. In effect, this order immunizes all the most senior officials in the Maliki government from any corruption investigation. Is this true? Is this what this order does provide? And did Ma Prime Minister Maliki's office issue orders protecting current or past ministers from, cur from corruption investigations? Um, Mr. Chairman, no one in Iraq is going to escape corruption probes. I don't care what kind of order is No, issued. no. Is there, it, do you, do you, uh, do you, are you aware of that order? Uh, I, I believe that you are referring to uh, something that is because there's an executive branch and a legislative branch. 
uh, that are treated differently? Is that the point? No. The point of the order is that Prime Minister Maliki has issued an order saying that, that he may not be investigated, nor may his minister be investigated uh, for corruption, which means they're immunized from any well, uh, investigation for corruption by the Iraqi. Excuse me. Excuse yes. me, Secretary yes. Ray. Excuse me. Which means they're immunized from investigation by the Iraqis themselves of corruption. Are you aware of that order? And does it trouble you that such an order has been issued? Well, Mr. Chairman, I will have to get back to you. I don't know precisely what you are referring to. It is our understanding that the Iraqi leadership is not indeed immune from investigation. Well, we held this hearing on October 4th. The State Department sent Ambassador Butler to testify. We went through all of this with him. We even gave him copies of this order. And I don't know if you're telling us you haven't seen them, or now that you've seen them, you don't believe them. No, I'm telling you, Mr. Chairman, that I will get back to you on this question. If, in fact, there is such an order, and if this order is meant to immunize rather than to uh, make certain that the investigation is by appropriate bodies in Iraq, that would certainly be, be concerning. This order was shown to us by Judge Roddy. It was discussed at our October 4th hearing. We even asked Ambassador Butler from the State Department about it. And we expected you would come in and give us your, your, your view of such an order, because in effect says, well, you believe everything is going to be investigated in Iraq. They are not planning to investigate corruption by the Prime Minister or any of his ministers. And if that is the order, I think you ought to tell us that you are as outraged as we are because we want corruption investigated and not just left for you to get back to us another time. Uh, Mr. Chairman. I have just stated that it would not be the intention of the United States of America that any official in Iraq, including the Prime Minister, the President, or members of the Council of Representatives, would be immune from investigation for corruption. I must get back to you on the specifics of the order that you are talking about, because I don't know whether there are other bases on which people can be investigated. But I will tell you unequivocally that if there is a situation in which the Prime Minister or the President of the Council of Representatives could escape uh, investigation from uh, concerning corruption, yes, that would be deeply concerning and it would not be uh, an acceptable policy from the point of view of the United States. Thank you very much. I gather I have used my, uh, pretty much my full ten minutes, so we will go to Mr. Welch first time when it comes around to the Democratic side. I will yield to Mr. Davis for his ten minutes. Um, thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, let me just ask, though, wouldn't it be unusual for senior department officials of any administration? Oh, what is the situation? Okay, go ahead. You okay? Okay. Republican or Democrat to make public accusations of corruption about an ally where we are engaged in significant military, diplomatic, and political efforts? I mean, what would be the uh, implications of publicly chastised? Well, Representative Davis, um, I wouldn't want to make public allegations about corruption uh, for anybody unless I could be certain that they were substantiated, uh, corroborated. And I would hope that it would be understood that the last thing that we want to do is to uh, talk about allegations rather than fully investigating them, uh, rather than taking the time to see if they can be corroborated. And uh, that would, by the way, follow whether it was an ally or an adversary. I think that it is uh, best for the integrity of the United States uh, that we not uh, simply engage in, uh, in allegations that may or may not be uh, corroborated. Well, let's turn to a more proactive note. What are we doing uh, to address corruption in Iraq at the diplomatic level? Well, uh, we understand that corruption is a pervasive problem in Iraq. But as you said, uh, Congressman, uh, this didn't come with the United States. Uh, this is a place that uh, was, of course, a dictatorship. Uh, there was corruption before we got there. Uh, there was, of course, the Oil for Food program, which we know was a source of considerable corruption. And by the way, not just corruption of Iraqi officials, but corruption of a number of international officials as well. Um, so what are we doing? We are working uh, very aggressively with the Iraqis. We've spent almost $47 million in anti-corruption measures with them. 
uh, we have supported their institutions, the Commission on Public Integrity, the Board of the Supreme Audit, and the Inspector General. And uh, there's an additional uh, 350 or so million dollars that is going into rule of law programs. But I just want to emphasize, in almost every discussion that I have with leaders, with finance ministers, with ministers of defense from almost any country in the world that is not a mature democracy, corruption is a problem and it is one of the issues that the President has been strongest on and that will be true about Iraq as well. Do you think that the Iraqi government has the political will to fight corruption and try to put an end to it? I do know that there are people in the Iraqi government who feel extremely strongly about corruption and they certainly feel strongly uh, that no official should be immune from, um, from prosecution or indeed from being punished if corruption can be uh, demonstrated. And I want to just say uh, that the characterization of every Iraqi in the government as someone who is corrupt uh, and, uh, and engaging in graft, while uh, we admittedly sacrifice, um, I would just uh, challenge that there are any number of people in the Iraqi government who also have lost uh, family members, who uh, every day deal with uh, assassination and death threats. Uh, there are a lot of very brave Iraqis who are trying to make their country better as well. Thank you. Let me turn to the issue of, of, of the private contractors in Iraq, particularly security contractors, because that is really under your ambit. How do you uh, plan to increase the coordination between agencies here and on the ground in Iraq uh, with the security contractors? Well, I was very uh, grateful to the panel uh, that went out to Iraq, um, Pat Kennedy along with General Jalwan, uh, Ambassador Roy and uh, Mr. Boswell, and they have come back with a number of recommendations for better coordination uh, where the State Department is concerned. But I think the next step, um, Mr. Uh, Representative, is, Representative Davis, is that we will sit with the Defense Department. Uh, Bob Gates and I talked on the phone. He is traveling. We have asked uh, the Deputy Secretaries to establish uh, some recommendations on procedures for coordination, not just for state and defense, but there are multiple contractors working in Iraq for other agencies, other NGOs, and obviously we need a better coordinated policy for all of them. All right. Um, Mr. Shays, I would yield the remaining time, Mr. Shays. Thank you. Madam Secretary, thank you very much for coming. I, um, I can't think of hardly anything this new Congress, my Democratic colleagues, have done to help our soldiers win in Iraq and allow them to come home succeeding rather than failing to help the Iraqi people live in a safe and free Iraq, free from terrorism, free from foreign intervention. I frankly can't think of hardly anything. And I was struck by the comment of House Majority Whip James Clyburn, who said that basically if the Iraqi war went well, it would be bad for Democrats. I have served on this committee for 20 years. and. Everything this committee has done since we've gone into Iraq in this last year in particular has been to try to point out everything bad that is going on. What I'd like to ask you is, what would be gained? How will our troops be safer? How will they be able to succeed if you did a frontal assault against the prime minister uh, accusing him of being corrupt? Tell me what would be gained from that. Well, I see nothing that could be gained uh, from a frontal assault, but I, I want to repeat, uh, Representative Shays, what I've said. Um, our view is that corrupt practices are unacceptable, and we're working very hard in difficult circumstances to help Iraq develop uh, procedures and uh, not to allow people with impunity. So whoever it is, uh, they should not be engaged in corruption. But to assault the uh, Prime Minister of Iraq or anyone else in Iraq, with uh, here to, f here to uh, date unsubstantiated allegations or lack of corroboration uh, in a setting uh, that uh, would simply fuel those allegations, I think would be deeply damaging. And, I, and frankly, I think it would be wrong. Well, I've been to Iraq 18 times, and every time I've gone there, almost every time, I have been told by uh, American officials that we are continually to confront the Iraqi government on a whole host of issues among which is dealing with corruption at the highest levels. 
we know that we are doing that. But to have you have to come before a committee of Congress and declare uh, that the prime minister uh, is corrupt blows me away. And I'm grateful that you're showing an incredible concern for our troops who are there. Let me ask you this. Congress, um, recently in the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, 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 International Relations Committee, passed uh, a resolution uh, basically condemning, condemning Turkey of genocide. Uh, I happen to be on that resolution, but I can't imagine for the life of me what good that will do, how will that help us work with the Tur Turkish government, and how will that help us uh, have our troops in Iraq succeed, and what are the consequences of that resolution moving forward? Well, we believe that the consequences of that resolution could be quite dire. Um, first of all, we acknowledge the, and the President has acknowledged, the mass killings that took place uh, in 1915. He's acknowledged uh, that we uh, consider that a great tragedy. We've also asked the Turks to work with the Armenians on reconciliation and into, including reconciliation about the history. But it would uh, really damage our relations with a democratic ally who is playing an extremely important strategic role in supporting our troops uh, through Enserlik and through um, the movement of, of cargo. Uh, it would be damaging for a democratic ally, um, really one of the only democratic allies, a bridge between the Middle East and uh, the Western world, a, an Islamic democratic ally. And it would certainly uh, be very damaging at a time when, as I'm sure we're all following uh, in the newspapers, tensions are already high um, with Turkey uh, concerning Iraq. So it would be uh, deeply damaging. And I appreciate those who, despite the difficulty of the vote, decided uh, not to vote for the resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Davis. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for your uh, questioning. Secretary Rice, before we continue, would you just pull the microphone a little closer? Oh, sure. Some of the members are yeah. saying they, they have a difficult time mm -hmm. hearing you. Uh, Mr. Welch, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Rice, if in fact uh, the evidence that suggests Prime Minister Maliki is in fact protecting corrupt officials uh, exists, do you believe that the American taxpayers have a right to know yes or no on that? I believe very strongly that uh, First of all, the United States government has a right to know, and certainly the uh, American taxpayers will have a right to know, but Congressman, uh, I think we owe it to everyone to do thorough investigations, not to respond to allocations, not to respond to uncorroborated uh, evidence or un uncorroborated statements, and I'm going to hold to that because not only is it uh, potentially damaging to uh, relationships that uh, we are very dependent on in terms of the, uh, uh, the allegations that are uncorroborated, but it's wrong. So it, if, it's simply if, not right to sit in an open session and do that. If the American people have a right to know, uh, and you know what they have a right to know, when will you tell us what they want uh, to know? What, what the American people need to be assured of is that if there is uh, corruption, the United States is, in fact, dedicated to rooting it out. I want to just emphasize that uh, let's not take Iraq in isolation. Corruption no, is not I, just a pervasive, I, I if you'll, if you'll pardon, to let, me, let me just finish my no, point. The, the, if, the reason I want to Secretary Rice, please. Uh, all right. We well, only have limited time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I have an opportunity, though, to finish my answers? My question is only about Iraq. We have very limited time, uh, Madam Secretary, and that's the reason for my interruption. Let me ask you on this. On your point that you'll follow up and, and that you want to do thorough investigations, uh, we received information about this order Chairman Waxman asked about, that the Commission on Public Integrity, which is a, vial, which is a credible group, can't refer for criminal prosecution uh, the Iraqi Council Ministers or any current or former ministers without the Prime Minister's permission. My question to you is this. That obviously interferes with Iraq moving forward, with us moving forward. Will you ask the President of the United States to repudiate that blanket grant of immunity that is contained in that order after this hearing is over? Um, first of all, uh, if I may complete the sentence, uh, which is that uh, we need to understand that in uh, that Iraq in context that corruption is just yes, a pervasive issue in Iraq. It is a pervasive issue with many 
countries around the world, and we have been dedicated to rooting it out around the world. Secondly, there are other um, boards and other institutions in Iraq that are involved, involved in investigating corruption, like the Board of Supreme Audit and the Inspectors General. My point to the Chairman is that the United States would expect and would indeed uh, say to the Iraqi government that it expects that no official would be immune from uh, investigation or prosecution for corruption. That wasn't my question. My question is, if this order that gives blanket authority to the Prime Minister to block any prosecution stands and exists, will you ask the President, in furtherance of the need of the American taxpayer and the American soldier to know about corruption, will you ask the President to demand that the Prime Minister repudiate and rescind this order? Uh, what we have said, and I will repeat, the United States will not support uh, a policy that would prevent the investigation or the uh, bringing to justice of any official in Iraq who commits Do you believe that secret order practices. does interfere with uh, the full and complete are, investigation? There uh, are, that's a yes there or no. Are, there are other boards that investigate corruption, including the Inspector General. Um, I will say, will the gentleman Congressman, yield to me? Congressman Welch, yes. that I think it's important that uh, we talk to the Iraqi government and that we repeat precisely what I've said. We will not tolerate a situation, we would not support a situation in which anyone I, is immune. I will, yield to the chair, I will yield, yield to the chair, but it sounds like we will tolerate, or the President will tolerate, a secrecy, a, a blanket secrecy on, on investigations. That, that, that uh, the testimony seems to be that you think the Iraqi government can deal with because the Council of Public Integrity, but the man who was ahead of it was driven out of Iraq. He had 30 people who worked for him killed. He told us that there's no one in allowed to investigate corruption in Iraq, and we have this order from al-Maliki himself saying that unless he personally approves, no one may be investigated. You said you know of people in the Iraqi government who care about corruption. Is Prime Minister Maliki one of the people that cares uh, about corruption in Prime the Iraqi Minister government? Prime Minister Maliki has made the fighting of corruption one of the most important elements of his program. But I've, I will repeat again, Mr. Chairman, the United States of America does not support any policy that would make immune from investigation or prosecution any member of the Iraqi government, no matter how high. Mr. Well, well, one, well, there's one limited left. time. Uh, Madam Secretary, uh, the Independent Commission on Security Forces, uh, uh, chaired by General Jones, you're familiar with him. Yes. He's a credible person. He found sectarianism and corruption are pervasive in Iraq. And there's a State Department report on this topic that uh, Chairman Waxman asked for. It was unclassified until he asked for it, and it became classified. But according to press reports, that report, State Department report, said that Mr. Jobber, the Minister of Interior then at that time, that ministry was likened to a criminal mob. That's according to press reports of the State Department investigation. Is that report true or is it false? Um, I, Congressman, at the time of uh, the Ministry of Interior under that leadership, we had serious concerns uh, about the sectarian nature of that ministry. We had serious concerns about corruption in that ministry. We had serious concerns about uh, violence that might have been emanating from that ministry. Uh, it was one of the most important efforts that we undertook with the Iraqi government uh, to try and change the nature of that ministry. It is absolutely the case that there is much, much more work to be done. The Ministry of Interior is still a real challenge. But so yes, we were very concerned about the nature time of that ministry. has expired. Uh, Mr. Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, uh, Madam Secretary, I want to apologize to you for uh, the way some of the questioning is taking place. You are not being prosecuted, and uh, we are not prosecutors. And so uh, we'll try, I hope, to uh, give you an opportunity to answer the questions clearly and thoroughly. And I'd just like to say to the chairman, uh, the last uh, uh, member went over about two minutes, and I hope you'll be lenient with the major minority as well. Let me just say, uh, Madam Secretary, that Chair will uh, be fair. I have about three questions, and I'm not going to belabor the issue, but I'd like for you to answer them in sequence, if you would. 
First of all, I'd like for you to explain uh, why it's necessary to have contractors like they have, like Blackwater and others over there. I'd just like to know yes. why you think it's important. Second, uh, yesterday I'm on the Foreign Affairs Committee and I didn't get a chance to ask you a question, so I'd like to talk about a related issue, and that has to do with uh, Israel, because it's all in the same uh, area. Uh, Prime Minister Sharon gave Gaza back to uh, the Palestinians. He, he bulldozed the settlements over there. Uh, Hamas immediately took that as a base of operation for attacks on Israel. Now we as a, as, a, as a government are talking about a creating a Palestinian state and I'd like to get an answer from you on uh, how that should pr proceed and, and whether or not the absolute guarantee of uh, security for Israel will be a part of any negotiation. I don't think that uh, Israel with our, with our support should be giving up anything until it's written in blood that there will be uh, no, no more attacks and that Israel will have a right to, uh, to exist. Now, the other thing I want to talk about real quickly, and I'll let you answer the questions, is uh, there was an attack on September the 6th by Israel on a nuclear site, supposedly a nuclear site. Nuclear experts have said that that was, in their opinion, a nuclear site. Uh, I'd like to know what the administration is recommending to Israel and to others in that area to deal with the proliferation of nuclear weapons and uh, if we find out who it was that sent them there, what we intend to do about it. And uh, thank you very uh, much. Thank you. Congressman, I, I can't comment on the reports concerning the, um, the Israeli strike. Let me just say that if there uh, is evidence any place of proliferation, we are very actively engaged in, um, in uh, countering that proliferation, whether it be through the proliferation security initiative that we have launched or uh, taking down the AQ to Khan network or insisting with, uh, in negotiations, uh, for instance, with North Korea that it deal with its uh, proliferation activities. And so um, if you uh, don't mind that, that is as far as I can go on that issue. Um, on the Palestinian state, we believe that, and, and by the way, the Israelis themselves have said this since uh, Prime Minister Sharon's famous Herzliya speech in 2003, that it is uh, the case that uh, there should be a Palestinian state. That is the best way to secure the Jewish democratic state of, of Israel. It can't be a state born of terror, which is why we've insisted uh, that it be a leadership in the Palestinian territories that is uh, devoted to bringing its state about peacefully. And uh, finally, the United States, and especially this president, is absolutely devoted to the security of Israel. Um, we have uh, no intention of uh, encouraging the uh, establishment of a state that would leave uh, a vacuum and uh, create a more uh, dire security situation for, for Israel. Um, as to uh, the private security contractors, uh, we need them because our people have to be able to move around in a very dangerous environment. And let me just note that, uh, thank God, so far we have been able to provide that uh, security to our people. They have been able to move around. Uh, we believe that uh, we cannot uh, take on all of those tasks with our own diplomatic security, uh, nor can the military do that. And that was just reaffirmed by Generals, General Petraeus and Ambassador Crocker during the recent visit of the panel to Baghdad. But we do recognize that there must be sufficient oversight, sufficient rules. Um, and that is why I have accepted the recommendations of the panel um, on the private security contractors. Let me just say real briefly that probably many, many members of this committee and other committees have gone to Iraq and been protected by the contractors. And uh, I think many of us on both sides of the aisle will say that they have done an outstanding job. And I hope that the uh, investigation by the FBI when it is concluded will be given to all of us so we can really see what happened and, and know for sure that uh, what is being done about it. Are there any other members of I Yes. I will yield to the Chairman or to uh, Mr. Davis. Okay. Uh, thank you. I just note, I've just looked at this uh, document my friend from Vermont was uh, looking at, uh, number 282, uh, where it says uh, the uh, referring the following parties to the courts until obtaining the consent of the State of the Prime Minister. The way I read this document is they are trying to consolidate control. It's a, it's a turf battle, and they just don't want the things. I think that's a reasonable interpretation of it as well, not that they are trying to stop uh, corruption. I don't know if you have any comments on that at no. all. 
Well, uh, let, me, let me just repeat. Um, we can look at this document. We can look at uh, the testimony yeah. of Judge uh, Rutter. We, we know that there are problems with corruption. Absolutely. But um, I don't see anything to be gained by uh, publicly discussing allegations that are not yet investigated and proven, uh, by publicly talking about uh, things that could be um, rumor or unsubstantiated. If there are substantiated uh, claims, then we are going to, to uh, pursue them. And um, I just want to state again, Mr. Chairman, because I would like to state it in my own words rather than <coughs> having it be stated for me. It is the policy of this administration and I am quite certain that the President would feel strongly about this, that there shouldn't be corrupt officials anywhere and that no official, no matter how high, should be immune from <coughs> investigation, prosecution or indeed <coughs> punishment should corruption be found. Thank you. Let me just, Mr. Chairman, just to follow up, if I could, quick. The Ministry of Oil is regarded as the most dysfunctional and corrupt ministries in Iraq and the obstacle to peace and security in Iraq. General James Jones, the head of the Jones Commission, told the committee staff last week that it is unacceptable that a ministry as dysfunctional and as sectarian uh, and as possibly corrupt as the Ministry of Interior can be allowed, can be tolerated to exist, given the high price that we pay every day to try to help that country find its right place in the global family. So whatever the pressure points are that either we have to play or the United Nations has to play or the international community has to play in order to affect that kind of change, we should do that, in my view. What are these pressure points and how are the U.S. and the international community applying that pressure? Uh, yes. Um, the Ministry of um, Oil is uh, very much of a problem and uh, it is, again, uh, around the world, uh, ministries of oil in state-owned, uh, where their state-owned oil enterprises tend to be uh, a problem from this point of view. Uh, we have encouraged the Iraqis to um, have not just a strong ministry but also strong coordination between the ministries that are involved in oil and gas, transportation, um, oil and gas, uh, electricity. They have formed a task force to try to better coordinate between the ministries. Um, and we have undertaken a very major effort uh, to try to help them improve their execution, uh, their training of skilled personnel. Uh, these are efforts that are underway with the uh, Ministry of Oil. It, it has been a problem and uh, we have been working on precisely that problem. Time has expired. Uh, I just want to point out that the document that we have that was given us by Judge Roddy says, Peace, mercy and blessings of Allah be upon you. It has been decided not to refer any of the following parties to the Court until approval of His Excellency the Prime Minister is obtained. One, presidential office. Two, council of ministers. Three, current and previous ministers with appreciation. And then the, the official at the uh, prime minister's office. These are not unfounded allegations. This is uh, uh, Nuri al Maliki's edict that no one's going to be referred to court until he approves it. Now, not only are we worried about corruption, but we're worried about the corruption, tens of billions of it going to supply the uh, insurgents that are killing Americans, while other Americans are there fighting, all Americans there are fighting to keep Prime Minister Maliki in office. It is not just our concern about corruption around the world. It is our co concern about corruption where Americans are dying to support a government that appears to many of us as so corrupt it doesn't have the support of its own people. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I respond? Certainly. Uh, first of all, uh, we are not fighting to keep Prime Minister Maliki in office. We are fighting to help the Iraqis uh, to develop a, a democratic government that can provide for its people. Prime Minister Maliki is the, um, the leader of Iraq who was, out of an election process, uh, made the Prime Minister of Iraq by the Iraqis, not by the United States. So we are not fighting to keep him in office. We are trying to support the government of Prime Minister Maliki so that it can deliver for its people. I appreciate but I that. But I, I want to repeat, Mr. Chairman, yep. any order, any law that tries to shield ranking officials of any rank from prosecution or from investigation would be opposed by the United States. And we have been very clear with the Iraqi government that we do not, uh, that we would not tolerate, in fact, it would not be um, supported by the United States to have any official, no matter how high-ranking, immune from prosecution. Uh, Mr. Cummings. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, it's good to see you. Yeah. You are no doubt on the front lines of this uh, war in Iraq, and no amount of military surges or blank checks we write for this war will resolve the complex ethnic and religious conflicts that, that plague Iraq and its neighboring countries. Victory in Iraq is not possible without political reconciliation, and I'm extremely concerned about whether corruption in the Iraqi government is undermining our mission. Four years after we toppled Saddam Hussein's regime, the Iraqi government <coughs> remains the third most corrupt country in the world, according to Transparency International. And State Department IG Stuart Bowen, your IG, characterized it as a second insurgency. Corruption, and I, this is why the discussion here is so important, corruption funds terrorists who attack our troops. Corruption fuels sectarian divisions, corruption stymies reconstruction efforts, and certainly it erodes confidence in the Iraqi government. We have been told time and time again, when the Iraqis stand up, we can stand down. But I do not see how this is possible when the Iraqi people do not seem to have a leg to stand on. The, the agency that has the vital responsibility for fighting corruption in Iraq is your agency, the State Department. Yet I, am, I have serious questions about the job the Department is doing. The Committee has been investigating the effectiveness of anti-corruption efforts in Iraq, and what we learn are the following, and they are simply astounding. The State Department established two groups in the U.S. Embassy to address corruption in Iraq, the Anti-Corruption Working Group and an Office of Accountability and Transparency. We learned <clears throat> that these organizations have suffered from a lack of leadership, a lack of direction, and a lack of coordination. Coordination is so poor that the Office of Accountability and Transparency actually boycotted the meetings of the Anti-Corruption Working Group. We asked the former head of the Office of Accountability and Transparency whether he was aware, whether he was aware of any coordinated U.S. strategy to fight corruption in Iraq, and he, his answer was no. We asked the, another embassy anti-corruption official for his views, and he told us, you have got a system where the coordination is lacking. Here is what Michael Richards, the Executive Secretary of the Anti-Corruption Working Group, told us when we asked him what the working group had accomplished, and I quote, I would like to be able to say that we have done quite a bit in this area, but unfortunately we have not. This is very troubling, but the criticism does not end there. Independent investigators <coughs> were, were also highly skeptical. Stuart Bowen, your agency's Inspector General, has investigated your anti-corruption anti programs, and he testified about his findings before the Oversight Committee, uh, and this is what he said. He said U.S. anti-corruption efforts have suffered from poor coordination and focus. This is what he said, your, your guy. No strategic plan for this mission was ever developed. David Walker, the head of uh, the Government Accountability Office, released a report at our hearing, hearing finding that the United States Ministry capacity development <coughs> efforts have suffered from a, quote, lack of overall direction, and that the State Department's efforts are, quote, fragmented, duplicative, and disorganized, unquote. Secretary Rice, um, fighting corruption in Iraq is essential for our mission to succeed. But your own officer, your own officials and independent investigators told the committee that the Department's efforts are in disarray. The other side has said we need to uh, tackle the problem. You said it's your number one priority. It's very important to you. But it seems as if there are problems, and I just wanted to have your comments on the things that your people said. Now, this is not some pie in the sky somebody no. looking down and, and just yes. criticizing you. This is, this is your own department. Well, first of all, let me just say that there are an awful lot of people working on these anti-corruption programs, and they are doing it at great risk because it means they have to get outside the green zone very often, and they have to go out and they have to deal with uh, ministries, and they have to uh, deal with places where there is very little personnel that is skilled, and they are trying to build uh, systems where there were no systems. Uh, the coordination for these programs is uh, under a senior officer of the uh, ministry assistance teams who works uh, directly for, uh, uh, through the, the deputy chief of mission for Ambassador Crocker. Uh, that person is responsible for the coordination of these efforts. I will tell you it is sometimes very difficult when one day you can go out and the next day you may not be able to go out. And I know that there is some frustration in some of the Iraqi um, agencies uh, with the, uh, the pace of some of the programs. 
But I also know uh, that when you have people who are challenging old ways of doing business uh, in Iraq, in some of these uh, embassies, in some of these uh, ministries, in some of these organizations, that you're going to get uh, some of the comments that you're getting. But these programs are coordinated. Ministry assistance is coordinated through a very senior officer in Baghdad. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Uh, Mr. Micah? Thank you. Um, well, Secretary Rice, uh, our committee has a very important responsibility, as you know. It's the uh, principal oversight and investigations uh, committee of Congress. Uh, been honored to serve on it uh, for 15 years, and uh, I think all of us want to make certain that um, you all do the best job, and we, we make certain that you do the best job. Um, now, I heard Mr. Cummings say that the government, well, we, we've, I guess it's four years now since, uh, uh, since um, I guess we started the, our efforts there, but the government's been in place how long? The governments have been in place a little over a year, in fact, about uh, eight, 17, 18 months. Uh -huh. uh, and they, the government was duly elected. Uh, I mean, was there any corruption in the election process that we're aware of? It was probably one of the most monitored. It monitor. was a, it was a well-run election. And I guess there was a lot of hope uh, when we 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 got that government in place. I remember the folks with the the thumb and the, you know uh, how proud they were to have voted. Uh, but I guess the insurgents kind of uh, took advantage of the situation. They didn't like it, and uh, with, the, with the destruction of the mosque and the beginning of uh, what was a s somewhat of a civil and religious war, you inherited a new set of responsibilities. Uh, but uh, you have certain constraints that you work under. This is a duly elected sovereign government. Is that not correct? Uh, that is correct. Um, it's interesting, too, that, you know, uh, of course, these here, we have a responsibility to do hearings, and they've done hearings, and they've tried to make the administration look as bad as possible, and the military look as bad as possible, and the contractors and the Iraqi government, today sort of a combo, <laughs> uh, sort of a combo hearing where we make both uh, the State Department look bad, the Iraqis look bad, the contractors look bad. Um, the situation I've heard is much better in Iraq. Uh, members just returned from last weekend told me that they actually didn't wear flak jackets and uh, walked around uh, escorted uh, uh, pretty casually. As the situation, you've had to adopt to some pretty tough situations. Uh, one of the difficulties in trying to sort of get your act together and control the situation has been the uh, violent situation from basically last summer to when the yes. surge took place. Uh, we now have a different situation. Is it possible you think that we could begin to stand down some of the, uh, of the security uh, contracts that we've had, or is that preliminary? I think it's probably early to, to consider that, but I will say that the security situation and the improvement in the security situa situation has made it possible. <laughs> Um, to uh, have a more ramped up, uh, some of these programs can be more ramped up. Mm. It's also been very good to embed with the provincial reconstruction, the re reconstruction teams with the brigade command teams because it allows us to get out in the provinces. You know, I just want to say while we're talking about all of the failures of the Iraqi government and uh, the difficulties that we have in helping them to build um, a modern um, governing structure, which, by the way, uh, we've had a long time to do that, and modern governing structures don't come easily. Um, I just want to note that, for instance, the programs that we're running on budget execution with their Ministry of Finance and with their ministries has uh, meant that instead of the 20 percent of budget that they were able to execute last year, it's now 70 percent. And this in a country that didn't even have a functioning banking system. And so um, I don't want uh, the members to leave the impression uh, that the Iraqi government is not functioning. Uh, we have been able to get, for instance, $220 million out to the Anbar province to, uh, to support the surge. And I know that a number of members have been uh, in Iraq and have gone to see the circumstances in which people are, are dealing. Mr. Chairman, I don't know how long it's been since you were in Iraq, but um, it would be uh, a, an invitation to any member of the committee, including to you, Mr. Chairman, uh, to go out to Iraq. 
uh, to meet with our ministry assistance teams, perhaps to accompany one to one of these ministries, to perhaps go out with one of the brigade command teams to see how these PRTs work, well, to see the difficult circumstances in which they're, they're finally, uh, uh, one, acting. I wanted to try to get one more question in about yes. corruption. I, uh, one of the subcommittees I chaired on this committee was criminal justice drug policy. I'll never forget a meeting I had in Mexico City. Uh, it was in the late 90s, and uh, I basically stood up and screamed at the uh, Mexican officials that the corruption they, uh, was so bad that they were in danger of losing their own country. We had evidence that up to the President's office there was corruption. Uh, I met with a Ukrainian official a couple of years back, and uh, he begged me not to send any aid there because he said it was uh, so corrupt. But uh, in fact, uh, uh, even with some nations like Mexico, which has been around a long time, or emerging democracies like Ukraine, it is difficult, even where you have relative peace, uh, to, to get the situation under control. Gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Could Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to just Could try I to refocus courtesy, Mr. the. Mr. Uh, Chairman, of having her respond about Mr. Mexico. Chairman, um, no. Gentleman's time has expired. Mr. I didn't Chairman, hear a question. Oh, Mr. That's Chairman, rude. I believe that we ought to allow the Chairman. Secretary, if she wishes, to make a response. Uh, please, go ahead. I don't want to interrupt you from uh, well, responding, but I didn't hear the question. Well, but if you, you heard a question, I, let's hear it. Yes, a I, I think to the, it. the point is one that I was trying to make in response uh, to uh, Representative Welch as well, which is that uh, corruption in government is not unique to Iraq. Uh, Iraq has special circumstances of war, of uh, coming out of dictatorship and out of uh, an oil for food program that, frankly, did uh, bring about the possibilities, the elements for corruption. Uh, but just as we do around the world, we are working very hard, even harder in Iraq, because uh, we recognize the, uh, the tax on the Iraqi people and, frankly, on our efforts that corruption brings. Okay, thank you. Mr. Tierney? Thank you, Mr. Tierney. Uh, Madam Secretary, I just do want to refocus it to what this hearing is about, which is corruption in Iraq and what the State Department may or may not be doing to make sure that uh, we have a handle on that. We don't have $600 billion spent in Mexico or else places. We don't have 160,000 troops exposed uh, there on a daily basis. Uh, and, you know, statements made earlier uh, by some people here that, you know, that a lot of people are thinking that, they, uh, that everybody in Iraq is corrupt or whatever. That's a red herring. We're looking to find out what's going on with those who may be corrupt and whether or not the State Department is, is doing what it should be doing in that regard. We had testimony here not on some speculation but on facts that there were billions of dollars uh, involved in corruption much of that was going to militias. The militias, in turn, were shooting our troops. That's why uh, we're having this hearing on this basis. Now, Mr. Cummings talked earlier about the fact that uh, you've expressed concern about the levels of corruption uh, in Iraq, but we were under the impression, having listened to the testimony of Mr. Bowen, who's from your office, and having listened to the testimony of Mr. Walker, uh, that there was no real coordination of this effort. Uh, you indicated that a very senior officer in Baghdad is in charge of that. So can you tell me why Mr. Bowen would not know that and Mr. Walker would not know that after thorough investigations? Is this person recently appointed? Uh, no, this is the person who runs the ministry assistance teams uh, to try to root out corruption in the ministries. And uh, by the way, I see Stuart Bowen every time he comes back, as well as every time he goes forward. And um, I, we try very hard to implement his recommendations. But in fact, the ministry assistance teams are coordinated by a senior officer at the embassy. Okay. Well, here's his finding on when he testified on October 4th that there has not been adequate leadership in the embassy's anti-corruption programs, and there is no single coordinative point for the United States support for Iraq anti-corruption efforts. Mr. Walker, Comptroller General of the United States, he testified before the committee, and he issued a report, and he, that report says the United States efforts suffer from a lack of overall direction and that no lead agency has been put in charge. So I guess the simple question is, if it's that significant to the administration's goals, of political reconciliation, either why hasn't somebody even put one single person been put in charge of it, or if he has, why don't your own investigator and the GEO know about that? Uh, the, the person who is in charge, of course, uh, is the ambassador to coordinate uh, the various programs. But the ministry assistance programs are coordinated by a very senior officer, and much of the effort at fighting corruption and fighting systemic corruption goes through the ministry assistance programs. We also have rule of law programs that are coordinated by very senior officers in working to develop better practices for the prosecution of people uh, who are accused of corruption and investigation of corruption. So is it your testimony that your Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction, Mr. Bowen, is just flat out wrong 
when he makes his assertion that there is not an adequate leadership and that there is no single coordinated point for U.S. support for Iraqi anti-corruption efforts? Uh, Congressman, I, I've talked to Stuart Bowen every time, and we've tried to implement his uh, recommendations. But I would question, and perhaps I can get back to you, I would question whether the right way to go about this is to have a coordinator for corruption or to have a coordinator for ministry assistance, a coordinator for rule of law, and that's how we've gone about it. One of his findings w was that the, the agencies that you mentioned that were supposed to be targeting aspects of corruption were boycotting each other's meetings. Were you aware of that? I've just, uh, I've heard that, uh, who's boycotting what? Each other's meetings. In other words, they were not attending meetings called by each of those groups that were supposed to get together. I'm not aware of you're what not aware you're talking of about, no. The Office of Accountability and Transparency at the Embassy in Baghdad uh, is an important mission. I think you'd agree. It's the group the State Department uh, has that's supposed to work with Judge Roddy or other anti-corruption officials in Iraq. But what we learned during our investigation and, and the hearing is that 10 months since the office was established, there's had been at least four acting or permanent directors. In 10 months, four acting or permanent directors. The most recent acting director previously served as a paralegal who performed administrative functions for the embassy. Now, Secretary Rice, nobody here is, is certainly trying to pick on this paralegal. We have great admiration for anybody serving uh, in Iraq and, and serving their country. But how is it possible that with this important position that there is a paralegal involved, uh, not an experienced diplomat, not a uh, person with training in di diplomacy and anti-corruption practices? The very senior people who are serving in Iraq oversee all of these programs. And but uh, if I can interrupt, this is the head of the Office of Accountability and Transparency. This is a woman who's a paralegal who apparently has no training in diplomacy or anti-corruption efforts. How can that be? I will have to get back to you on that one, uh, Congressman Tierney. Well, the latest information, as long as you're going to get back to us, is, is in fact that her position has been cut, which seems a little ridiculous. So uh, that's so if you would you also know, get back uh, to us uh, on that, uh, I'd Mr. appreciate it. Congressman, I think what I should probably get back to you with is a um, sense of how we manage these programs, because I can't respond to a single post that may have been reorganized into some other post. When Ambassador Crocker went out to uh, Iraq, he reorganized considerably and significantly some of these programs so that they would be more effective. Well, yeah, it would and be helpful so if you would get back. a program here or an office right. there may well have been uh, integrated into something else. I'll get back okay. to you on I that. don't think so, Secretary Rice, but I'd be happy if you get back no. to us, because that's not what your you? Inspector General tells us. That's not what Mr. Walker tells us. It's not what the testimony told us. And we weren't able to get into it anymore because you didn't allow certain members from the State Department to testify before this committee in open well, hearing. Well, I have to answer that, Congressman, yeah. because, in fact, I have told members of the State Department that they should uh, be willing to speak with the committee. The question we has to, been... Fact, we had to issue four subpoenas the, the in question, order to get that the testimony. The question has been on some of these issues, whether or not closed or open session is more appropriate. No, some of those issues were four subpoenas just to get testimony, not whether it was closed or open. We had to issue four subpoenas just to get the cooperation to come in and testify. Well, I have told everybody in our department to be uh, responsive to this committee. Well, I hope they'll be yeah, more responsive to you, Madam Secretary. Gentlemen's time has expired. I do want to point out that James Santel, who's your uh, anti rule of law coordinator at the embassy, he's the one you said is coordinating things. Well, uh, he did cooperate with us and talk to us, and his statement to us was, "You've got a system where the coordination is lacking," and he's referring to uh, all of the dysfunction and disarray that appears to be going on, frustrating U.S. anti-corruption efforts. Well, if I would hope that he will have reported that to the ambassador so that it can be remedied. Well, I'm sure he has. If you yes, talk to well, us, I'm, he reported I, to the ambassador. Well, I'm, Maybe I'm, you ought to talk I'm to the ambassador certain, to report to I'm you. I'm certain that Ambassador Crocker would want to uh, remedy any such situation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Westmoreland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just to kind of follow up on it, I'm sure uh, Mr. Santel uh, is working to find somebody to be the permanent replacement uh, in the office of... Uh, accountability and transparency. Is that not true? Well, uh, first of all, again, um, Ambassador Crocker has gone to great lengths to reorganize a lot of these efforts so that they are less duplicative and so that there is not so much overlap. Uh, when there are vacancies, we try and make certain that Ambassador Crocker has the very best talent available to him. I know, and perhaps this is the explanation, that Ambassador Crocker was not always satisfied with the level of talent that he was getting. 
So the department undertook a major effort to get more senior people uh, to staff Ambassador Crocker, uh, people who had more appropriate skills and people who had language skills. So that, for instance, uh, the three top officers in Ambassador Crocker's office right now have all been ambassadors in their own right. Thank you. Um, Madam Secretary, let me thank you for, for the hard work you're doing for this country and uh, your professionalism uh, every time I see you. So thank you for that. Um, you know, we, we're a committee of oversight and government reform is, is official title, but lately it's almost been investigate and attack. Uh, has been uh, uh, kind of this committee's motto. We, we, we investigated, uh, you know, the military and what all was going on over there. And now that the surge is working, we seem to need to find another target. And unfortunately, um, usually our targets are somebody that has Republican ties or a successful businessman or part of the administration. So uh, I guess you fall into that uh, part of the administration part of it. But we have we've recognized, uh, and this country has been around for over 200 years, and we still have corruption here, many th things of corruption. We don't like it, and we try to do the best we can. But as you mentioned, that young government over there uh, and the influx of money that has been over there uh, that we have sent and other countries have sent uh, to, a, to a people that, number one, has never been involved in a government before, and number two, never had any really wealth. And so the atmosphere has been for corruption. Uh, but you've acknowledged the, the prevalence of it there. And in, in your dealings with the Iraqi government, what is your sense of their commitment to ending it? I believe that they very much want to end it because they know uh, that it is a problem for governance. It is, after all, now a democratic society. And by the way, uh, if you think that there are stories about corruption uh, in Iraq in our newspapers, you should see some of the reporting in the free Iraqi press, something that would not have uh, existed without the liberation of Iraq from Saddam Hussein. So in fact, their own people are concerned about corruption and are uh, concerned to expose it. Uh, but yes, it's a real problem. Corruption is a real problem. It's a young government. It's a government that comes out of a dictatorial past. It's a government that has oil wealth, which uh, we know sometimes leads to uh, corruption. And it's a government that's fighting a war. And uh, they, by the way, also have no interest in having money go uh, to militias that are uh, killing our soldiers because it's kill they're killing their soldiers and, uh, frankly, many of their families. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for being here, and thanks for your uh, uh, attention and your willingness to set through this thank process. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, thank you for your willingness to testify here. As you know, the administration has already uh, committed $450 billion uh, to securing and rebuilding Iraq, and right now uh, Congress has before it a, an additional request. Uh, received recently for another $196 billion from the President. We in Congress have, have at least a couple of roles in this. Uh, first of all, we are the direct elected representatives of the families whose sons and daughters are uh, putting on that uniform and uh, in many cases making the ultimate sacrifice in Iraq. We also, in our constitutional role here, exercise the power of the purse. Now, the power of the purse is not simply the power to open the purse and, and surrender the contents. In our, our roles as, uh, as appropriators, we also are responsible for re scrutinizing these requests. And uh, that requires that we make informed decisions. We've had several reports so far, and I know you talked about unfounded reports of uh, or rumors of, uh, of corruption, but we've got, we've got some pretty good reports here. Uh, this one is from the GAO, uh, David Walker, uh, Stabilizing and Rebuilding Iraq that has extensive sections on corruption. I've got one here by the Special Inspector General of Iraq Reconstruction, Joint Survey of the U.S. Embassy Iraq Anti-Corruption Program. Uh, there's another report somewhere here by uh, General James Jones of the United States Marine Corps about corruption. Uh, your own State Department has a couple of internal reports that you've classified that, that talk about corruption. 
You've denied hundreds of documents pursuant to a subpoena issued by this, this committee, Chairman Waxman, that, that offer other evidence of, of, of corruption. So to say that this is unfounded or that we don't have, we don't have a hard case is, is, is really unbelievable. And the idea that we have to wait till there's a prosecution or some type of indictment, our kids are on the ground now. They are on the ground now in that country fighting and dying. And we cannot wait a moment longer be before we talk about this. That's what we want to do. We want to talk openly, publicly about the corruption in Iraq. And we want to know as appropriators whether it's a good idea to send $196 billion to a country where, where the government has severe corruption. And, and we have to do our, 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 our responsibility here, our constitutional duty. And there's one, one point I'd like to, to make on this before I ask my question. It has been said by the State Department that this, if we talked about corruption in Iraq, it would, it would hurt our relationship with the Iraq government. The fact of the matter is it would be good. It would be good for our relationship with the Iraqi people if we talked about the corruption in their own government. I think that uh, democracy is aspirational. We're, we're certainly not perfect, and we've had a lot of people talk about that today. But I think it signals our high expectations of democracy in that country and in our own that, that we, we put it all out there. Sun, sunlight is the best disinfectant. And uh, I think that closing off that evidence is, is complicit with its covering up some of the corruption that's going on there, some that we know about. So I want to ask you this. Knowing that, that more transparency will be helpful in this country and in Iraq on this subject, Will you rescind the directive that prevents the State Department employees, high-ranking State Department employees, coming here and discussing in great detail the levels and, and degree of corruption in Iraq? Will you do that? Congressman, first I have to correct the record on a few things that you've said, if you don't mind. The first is I did not say that to talk about corruption would hurt our relationship with the Iraqi government. I said that I was not prepared to engage in discussions of premature allegations, prematurely of allegations, or uh, things that may be uncorroborated or unsubstantiated until, in fact, they had. And I saw no good purpose in doing so. I'm here talking right now about corruption in uh, Iraq, about concerns of corruption in the ministries, concern in corruption in particularly the Ministry in of Interior. In very vague terms, though, Madam Secretary, uh, with, I'm, all, I'm here with all due respect. I'm here talking about specifically about our concerns about corruption. Now, if you'd like us to be able to actually do anything about corruption, uh, Congressman, we have to be able to investigate it. We have to be able to uh, get the testimony of people who are bringing the stories and the facts to us. We have to be able to protect them from what is obviously a very hostile environment. We have to be able to preserve that access. That is why we have offered to have you have any document that you would like and any official who would be able to address those documents to come and spend as much time as you would like in closed session so that we can protect the underlying sourcing and the underlying uh, people who bring those allegations to us. Well, and let, I, I let me renew, just say a couple things, and, and I'm, I'm living on that, time, Madam Secretary, I'll, and I appreciate, that, I appreciate that. But the fact of the matter is, is this directive that came out of the State Department instructs, instructs the employees uh, not to talk about broad statements or assessments which judge or characterize the quality of Iraqi government, uh, governance or the ability or determination of the Iraqi government to deal with corruption, including allegations that investigations were thwart, thwarted stifle, or stifled for political reasons. And so All right, let on me top say of right that, now, just please, yes. I, I have limited time. Yeah, uh, you do. On and top it, of that, you know, we have a directive by the, by the Iraqi government itself that, uh, by Nouri Maliki, that has basically said no prosecution of any ministry can go forward without my approval. So that's that's a stopgap as well at that level. So we're not, we're not seeing a lot of that. So, uh, um, Would you like me to answer, Congressman? That, that would be great. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Secretary. Uh, the first uh, point that I'd like to make is that um, directives come from me. I didn't make this directive, consider it rescinded. 
Secondly, um, I uh, will nonetheless direct that anyone who uh, is speaking on these matters uh, should do so uh, in closed session because there are underlying sourcing issues, there are underlying uh, testimonies from people who might be either in danger or who may not come back to us if they're exposed. I want to renew the offer that I made to the chairman, which is that any document that relates to this, any official who might have knowledge of those documents is available to you at any time, anywhere in closed session. Now, as to the Iraqi government, um, I have said that the United States will not support any law or any uh, order that would try and shield Iraqi leaders, no matter how high, Iraqi officials, no matter how high, from prosecution in a, or investigation. Well, Madam Secretary, what Mr. I just heard Mr. is Mr. Lynch, I'm sorry, but your time has <laughs> expired and the last pen pending question was uh, responded to. We do have to be uh, considerate of the other members. Mr. Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, I have, uh, first let me say I have very great admiration and respect for you, especially so since uh, a few years ago when I heard you speak to the National Prayer Breakfast. But uh, let me ask you this. Uh, William F. Buckley wrote in 2004 that uh, if he had known in 2002 what he then knew in 2004, he would have strongly opposed the war. More significantly, he wrote in June of 2005 that if we had as many as 500 U.S. deaths over the next year, that we would reach a point where, uh, quote, tenacity conveys not steadfastness of purpose but misapplication of pride. We've had over 2,000 U.S. deaths since that time, and I wonder, first of all, how you would respond to Mr. Buckley. Secondly, uh, uh, before the war started, many articles said that Lawrence Lindsay, the, the President's economics advisor, was dismissed because he had very publicly said a war with Iraq would cost 100 to 200 billion dollars. In a very small briefing that I was called to at the White House just before our vote, I was I asked about that and I was told, oh no, the war wouldn't cost nearly that much, 50 to 60 billion, and some of that would be paid for by the Iraqis themselves. I'm wondering if you are shocked or surprised at how much these costs have escalated to. And I'm thinking back to a column that the conservative foreign policy columnist Georgie Ann Geyer wrote in 2003, a few months after the war, in which she said that Americans would inevitably come to a point at which they would have to decide did they want a government that provides services at home or one that seeks empire across the globe. And I'm, I know everybody would like to have a $5 million house but they know they can't afford it. And many fiscal conservatives have reached a point where they feel we really can't afford these excessive, extravagant, staggering costs of this war. So I'd like your comments to both of those, yes. to respond to both of those columnists. Well, uh, yes, uh, Congressman, if I, um, I, it's always uh, difficult to go back and try and situate yourself to know then what you know today. Uh, but even with that limitation, I would say yes. I think to the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, the liberation of Iraq, and the chance for Iraq to become a different kind of country in the center of the Middle East, from which uh, the Middle East, uh, from which comes uh, many of the problems of terrorism and uh, danger that we face as a country. Yes, it is worth it. I know that it has been difficult, and I indeed know that it has been uh, expensive, and. Uh, Yes, frankly, it has been harder than I thought it would be because I don't think that we understood just how broken uh, this country was under Saddam Hussein's dictatorship. But I would remind that this is someone against whom we fought a war before. He was going to remain a threat to this vital region as long as he remained in power. And yes, I think it was worth uh, overthrowing him. It is also worth it to stand by the Iraqi people as they face the multiple challenges of trying to develop a functioning uh, democratic state in the heart of the Middle East. I think our security will be better for it. Um, the security of the international community will be better for it. Um, I cannot 
uh, by any means make up for the terrible sacrifice. Uh, nothing that I can say will ever bring one of our soldiers back. But I can say that I think nothing of value is ever won without sacrifice, and yes, I do believe it has been worth it. Let, let me just conclude by saying, as one who has opposed this war from the beginning and still does, uh, I, I want to apologize to you for the rude way that you were treated by some of these uh, anti, so-called anti-war demonstrators. Those people need to realize that they do much more harm than good to their cause. And uh, also, Mr. Shays asked that I point out that uh, we're not sending this $196 billion, which I think is way too much money, but we're not sending it to the Iraqis. We're, we're, that's, uh, we're using most of that for our own military Cost. Yes, thank you. That thank it you is. Very thank you very much, uh, Representative. The gentleman has a little time left. Would he yield to me? I'll yield it to. Uh, I, I thank you for yielding to me. I did want to respond to the Secretary's offer that we have a closed door session to receive testimony from witnesses and to see documents. The problem with that offer is that you will give us information that we then cannot make public because it's then uh, confidential. And I think there are a lot of things that ought to be made public. And one question I would want to know, and I think it ought to be answered publicly, is money that's being taken from corruption, through corruption, uh, from the Iraqi government, funding the terrorists that are killing our troops? You don't have to name a source. You don't have to identify anybody that's confidential. But we ought to know that information, and I'd hope you'd answer that question as we go into a debate about whether we're going to give another $196 billion to this war. There are militias that are being funded by multiple sources, um, including uh, people who are able to use uh, the Iraqi system to bring funding to their militias, yes, uh, in the South in particular. But well, a much bigger problem, a much bigger problem, Mr. Chairman, and one that will be there in spades if we don't complete this mission is the support that those militias are getting from Iran. Well, I think that's a very important issue and it needs to be debated. But I don't want to take an offer from you to give this Congress of the United States information that we can then not talk about publicly as we debate these important policy questions. And the, the only and that is our disagreement on yes, that question. Yes, I understand. But, Mr. Chairman, if I may say, uh, it is not at all unusual that information is provided to the Congress that cannot be made public for reasons of, of sourcing. And so I renew the offer to you. We, we don't need to get into to sources, but there are a lot of questions we ought to have answered that don't involve sources. We'll discuss this further, but I do want you to, to know that your offer, uh, while you may feel is generous, is not consistent with, I think, the proper rules between the executive and the legislative branch. But it is um, Mr. Yarmuth's time for Thank questions. you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Secretary Good morning. Rice. Um, last year, October 2006, in a State Department briefing, you made the following broad assessment, I'll characterize it, uh, about Prime Minister Maliki, the Interior Ministry, and corruption in Iraq. You said, I think he's a very good and strong Prime Minister. As you know, they've really started to take action. We've said many times that the Interior Ministry and the prior government, before the permanent government was put in place, was not active enough in <clears throat> really rooting out potential corruption and potential violence within the ministry itself or the ministry forces, and so they are really starting to take some actions of that kind. Uh, we've heard today, and, and we heard in our hearing three weeks ago from uh, Inspector General Bowen that uh, he talked about the rising tide of corruption in Iraq. It's getting worse and is now a second insurgency, he called it. And Judge uh, Roddy, we've, we've heard, uh, says corruption is getting worse because of the sectarianism in the country and the lack of the rule of law. What I'd ask you is, if you're willing to give a broad assessment, no sourcing, a broad assessment as to whether over the last year since you made that statement, corruption in Iraq has gotten better or worse. Um, I really would be uh, reluctant uh, to make such a broad statement uh, because I would submit to you, Congressman, that in some places it's gotten worse and in some places it's gotten better. And so if we want to do a net assessment, I think I ought to go do a net assessment for you. But it is very clear to me that some of the problems that existed, for instance, in budget execution have been uh, ameliorated and are better. It is very clear to me that some of the problems that existed in the Ministry of Interior are being addressed. 
but there are still pervasive problems of corruption in any number of ministries, including in the Ministry of Interior. I guess so that, some things have gotten better, some things have gotten worse. I can give you a net assessment. I can't give you a net assessment on the spot. Right. So you're not willing to agree with the, the broad characterizations that um, Mr. Bowen made and that uh, Judge uh, I'd rather do my own net assessment. Right. Thank you. Thank you. In, as part of our investigation, we also talked to State Department officials, again, trying to find out whether <clears throat> the situation has improved or not. And uh, when we interviewed uh, Mr. Folk, uh, who is um, the one of the U.S. Embassy's top anti-corruption officials. We asked him about your statement a year ago, and he said that he could not answer in an open forum, as you said, because it would require me to go into details that would break into the guidelines that were given to me. Uh, so basically, he said he was under orders not to comment whether your statement was <coughs> accurate or not. And my question is, if you're making broad assessments that are flattering, <coughs> to the Iraqi government, as you did in, in October 2006. And now, as your public policy, you're not willing to make those statements. Isn't it fairly obvious that you're afraid of concealing negative information and that any person with half a brain would understand that the situation is not good or else you'd want to talk well, about let, it? Well, let me, since I'm certain we all have a brain, <laughs> let me say it this way. The, there is a very bad problem of corruption in Iraq. It is a problem in ministries. It is a problem in government. It is a problem with officials. I don't think that's very flattering. Now, the effort has to be to help the Iraqis address that, that corruption and also to have an assessment ourselves through investigation and through taking information. Uh, you know, much of the information that you continue to put out by Seeger and so forth actually comes from the embassy looking into these issues themselves. So uh, one of the problems with, the, uh, with simply relying on the Inspector General reports, which by the way I do too, and as I said, I meet with Stuart Bowen every time that I can, uh, is that these are often issues that are being uncovered by the department and then reported to the uh, special, in, uh, special Inspector General. So it would be wrong to leave the impression is, is being done that somehow the Inspector General is going in and finding things that the State Department is trying to hide. If you look at his list, you will very often find that these are through interviews with our people who are in the process of trying to fight corruption. And, and it's very frustrating, I think, to those of us who sit here, that when we ask for assessments of the situation from the leadership of the State Department, that we don't get uh, candid answers, and I would submit to you that I and many others sitting on this panel are in our positions today because the American people was convinced that they weren't being leveled with about the conduct of this war. And that if we had been more candid, if the administration had been more candid, then maybe the, the approval rating for what we're doing over there would be of, of re, uh, reasonable levels. And unfortunately, this total stonewalling and lack of candor is what's contributing to a lack of confidence in the American well, people. Uh, Congressman, uh, if you don't mind, I will respond because uh, I don't know how to be more candid. There's a pervasive problem of corruption in Iraq. There is a problem in the ministries. There is a problem in the government. There are problems with officials. Our job is to try to investigate when we hear of and when people come to us. It is our job to put in place uh, anti-corruption efforts to help the Iraqis do so themselves. But I don't know how to be more candid. I don't know how to be less flattering. There is indeed a problem of corruption in Iraq that we are trying to address through multiple fronts. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Chase. Thank you. Um, it seems to me the basic uh, contention of the Democratic majority is because Iraq is corrupt, we need to uh, withdraw, uh, which has uh, come down from, well, we weren't winning, we needed to withdraw, it was immoral, we needed to withdraw. So that's basically what's on the table, uh, which is uh, patently absurd. Uh, Iraq is corrupt. We all know it's corrupt. We know it's pervasive. You know it's pervasive. Uh, but for you to be called before a committee to name names is destructive, and I'm happy that you have resisted that temptation. When I go to Iraq, I ask, are you uh, a Sunni? They say, I'm a Sunni, but I'm married to a Shia. I, I, I say to someone else, are you a Shia? They say, I'm a Shia, but my tribe is Sunni. I go to someone else and they say, I'm a Kurd. Are you a Kurd? And they say, yes, but don't you know we're Sunnis? 
they lecture me continually on the fact that they are Iraq, the nation of two rivers. And they say, didn't you study about us when you were in school? There is tremendous pride that the Iraqis have for their country. Bernard Lewis points out that there's a difference between patriotism and nationalism. And he said, in the Balkans, you had nationalism. My question to you is, do you see a patriotic spirit emerging? And I'm going to just add to this that we are const constantly lecturing the Iraqis on how they need to get their act together. And I haven't seen Congress pass hardly any legislation. I haven't seen them come to an agreement on even Iraq. We can't come on agreement on Iraq, yet we did on a bipartisan basis going in, two thirds of the House and three quarters of the Senate. But we here can't work together to decide how we deal with Iraq, yet we lecture Maliki on why can't he get his act together, Sunni, Shias, and Kurds. And my question to you is, one, your view of, of the intervention in the Senate that said break Iraq into three units, because uh, the feedback I get from the Iraqis is, how dare you tell us what to do? It's our country. I'd like your feedback on that, and I'd like you to speak in general about whether you see a sense of patriotism. Is Maliki doing what I think he's doing, trying to build consensus among Sunnis, Shias, and Kurds, trying to get 70% support where they can't even get support of 60% in the Senate? If you would speak to that. Yes, in fact, uh, what the Iraqis are trying to do um, is to pass their laws by more than a majority because they recognize that they're trying to buy into these very uh, fundamental and existential laws, uh, the entire Iraqi population, Sunni, Shia, and Kurd, which is why they don't want to just go with a 51 percent uh, majority. Um, it's been difficult. We continue to press them on passing these laws. I would just note that they did pass a budget. That's no small matter. Um, and that we that haven't done one here yet. Uh, that's my understanding, Congressman. Um, and that they are, in fact, executing that budget at a very higher rate than they did uh, last year, 20 percent last year, 70 percent this year, that they're getting the money out to places like Anbar, which leads me to your question about patriotism. While we're sitting here talking about um, all of the problems of the Iraqis, let's remember that it is the sheikhs of Anbar and their sons of Anbar who rose up to fight and to push al-Qaeda out with our help of an area that was just last year said to be lost uh, by our uh, intelligence agencies. Uh, let's remember that there are 60,000 concerned citizens, as they call themselves, who are part of neighborhood watches to guard their neighborhoods in Baghdad, in and around Baghdad. Uh, let's remember that uh, one of the, that the leader of awakening uh, the Sunni rebellion against the foreign uh, extremists uh, was killed in a brutal assassination attempt only to be replaced by his brother who stood and said that I will continue to fight because my brother will not have died in vain. So yes, there are patriotic Iraqis. Yes, there are Iraqis who are, but they're losing more forces by far, many times over than we are in the defense of their country. And uh, to go to your first point, Congressman, I know that there is corruption in Iraq. I, I don't think I've been trying to hide that fact here. Um, I know that there are lots of reports that need to be investigated, and we are more than willing to share those with this committee in an appropriate setting, uh, which, by the way, is not at all unusual in sharing uh, information that is sensitive. But the most important point that I would make is that if the implication is that because there is corruption in Iraq that we should simply uh, give up uh, on this extremely important security concern of the United States, then I think that in itself would be irresponsible. What we have to do is fight the corruption and help them to fight it. Gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Clay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Dr. Rice, I want to ask you about Blackwater. And I want to begin by commending you for taking action to strengthen oversight over this company and other private military contractors. Uh, but my question is, why has this, has this taken four years? There have been plenty of warning signs, uh, but it wasn't until the September 16th shootings triggered an international incident that the State Department finally acted. Uh, by that time, a lot of damage to the U.S. mission in Iraq 
uh, had already been done. And let me start my questioning by asking you about one of these warning signs. Uh, this is an incident that occurred on May the 12th, 2005. This was over two years ago near the, the start of your time as Secretary of State. I have a State Department cable that was sent from the embassy in Baghdad to you. I would like, and, and you have a copy, I believe. Uh, according to this cable, two Blackwater guards fired multiple shots at a car as it approached a Blackwater motorcade in Baghdad. The Blackwater guards killed one Iraqi civilian and wounded two others. The State Department conducted an investigation of this particular incident and concluded that the Blackwater personnel acted improperly. Uh, this is what the, of the official State Department report said. The victim's car was, and I quote, traveling at a moderate rate of speed on an open road displaying no aggressive behavior such as rapid acceleration or change in direction. The report also found that Blackwater's warning signals were perfunctory and, and that a reasonable person in the same circumstances would foresee them to be ineffective. The State Department's own investigation concluded lethal force was used prior to the exhaustion of all available options. What bothers me most about this incident is that the only sanctions requested by the State Department were that the two shooters should be dismissed and barred from any future employment. So, uh, Dr. Rice, do you think this was an appropriate response by the embassy? Um, since this was investigated by the embassy and by diplomatic security, um, and I don't have access at this moment to the full record of their response, um, I don't want to, um, to respond on the appropriateness of it. I do think that what we have done in insisting now on greater coordination and accountability uh, will help to avoid such incidents in the future. And, Congressman, I would note that one of the things that we believe is necessary, two of the things that we believe are necessary, first, that we really do have to review the order under which all of this has been being done since the creation of the Coalition Provisional Authority back in 2003. That is one of the problems, is the, the basis on which it's done. And we are working and believe that there needs to be legislation so that there can be appropriate action uh, taken when incidents of this kind well, uh, occur. Well, in, in this case, Doctor, the facts are not in dispute here. Uh, the, the f uh, your investigators found that an innocent Iraqi was shot and killed and that Blackwater was at fault, uh, yet the embassy recommended only that they lose their jobs. It, sh it shouldn't be a hard question to say whether that response was uh, sufficient. I'm, I'm was not it, I'm was not, it sufficient? I'm not going to second guess the decision of the people on the ground who investigated it, who looked into it, and made a, a response. Okay. Okay, but, but on top of that now, the incident should have been a warning sign and uh, that something was wrong in the State Department's relationship with Blackwater. Uh, but there were many other examples just a month later. In June of 05, the State Department found that a Blackwater team killed an innocent Iraqi in al Hila and tried to cover it up. Again, the only disciplinary action was dismissal, and there were many other similar incidents, including ones where I Iraqi officials protested Blackwater's actions. Yet for years, the State Department acted as Blackwater's enabler and never restrain the company's aggressive uh, tactics. Do you think you made a mistake by taking so long to recognize that the oversight of Blackwater uh, was woefully inadequate? Um, Congressman, there was certainly a concern to make sure that our diplomats were protected, and that has been achieved. I agree with the report of the team that I sent out that oversight has been inadequate, which is why we've moved to tighten at the oversight. Um, it is why we are uh, determined to have oversight not just of the State Department contractors, but to work with Bob Gates to have broader um, oversight as well. But again, these are decisions that were made um, on the ground by people who were reviewing the circumstances, and I'm not going to second-guess them here on the spot.
And you know, gentleman's time has expired, uh, Mr. McHenry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, Secretary Rice, thank you for being here. We've uh, had nine months of uh, numerous hearings um, covering the myriad of subjects we've already covered here today. Uh, your staff has testified, as you, I'm sure, well know, uh, extensively, um, and I'm sure uh, we've consumed a great portion of, of your time as well in helping them prepare their testimony, and I thank you for that. But the one thing we can't forget here is we're talking about a war zone and men and women's lives are on the line, brave men and women there in Iraq. And, and there have been a number of questions, and my colleague just asked one about contracting. It, it seems a contradiction to me that at a time when this Congress, the Democrat majority in Congress, wants to cut the level of troops, they want to nationalize contractors, thereby increasing the number of troops required for protective service of State Department officials, uh, embassy officials as well, as well as provincial reconstruction teams. It seems to me a contradiction when you espouse a smaller footprint in Iraq that you want to eliminate contracting. There have been a number of questions about this, but I, I want to ask, in regard to the State Department's use of contractors uh, versus full-time government employees, has, you know, what, what's a better use of taxpayer money? H have, have you analyzed this as, as an ongoing process in Iraq, and if you could just comment on that. Yes, well, we believe that we get, uh, in that sense, uh, it is a, a reasonable way to handle the significant problem that we have of providing protection for the, for the diplomats. I would repeat that when the team went out and they asked directly General Petraeus and Ambassador Crocker, uh, should this be done instead by diplomatic security, which, by the way, we've increased the numbers, the, the allocation to, do, to diplomatic security, uh, over time, but they were asked, should diplomatic security try to do this, which means you would have to bring it in-house? Should the military try to do this? And they were told, no, that would not be appropriate. So we're left with the need for private contractors. Now, there can be certainly better oversight of the private contractors, which is why we're taking the steps that we are taking. Uh, but this is the best way that we can find to uh, make sure that our people can get out of the green zone and go to do all of the programs that are being questioned here, whether they're on anti-corruption or budget uh, execution or uh, training personnel. So there are really three choices. Uh, the, the military can guard the State Department. Right. Uh, you could have in-house security, which would have to be a massive expansion of what is currently available, or you could use contractors. And the first two were, were rejected. Is that correct? Th that's correct. Has there been a cost-benefit analysis as a part of this? in terms of the cost to taxpayers? Well, I think that, first of all, if you, if you just imagine bringing on uh, enough diplomatic security agents to do this full time, and we will have to, as a result of the report, bring more people on. I think they said 100 people. But if you try to have uh, 11 or 1,200 uh, diplomatic security agents, uh, you're creating a career path, people who would, of course, be there for, um, for throughout a career, this is a, allows us to be flexible in terms of how temporary an assignment might be. So it's the cost benefit is very good, and I think you certainly wouldn't want American soldiers to have to do this, this task. Mr. Chairman. Well, and and if, I, if I may continue, uh, because a, as a part of this, the idea is that we are in Iraq not on a permanent basis. Therefore, you would not hire uh, career government workers to be there on a 30-year uh, basis, for instance, uh, with retirement benefits and things of that exactly. sort. Uh, it, so there have been advantages to uh, having contractors as part of the workforce uh, for the State Department. Yes, because you can uh, use it in a kind of accordion-like way to uh, increase when you need and to decrease when you don't need. Uh, that's not true if you hire permanent employees. So flexibility. Mm -hmm. uh, now let me move on to the provincial reconstruction teams. I, and I think this is a, a very key point uh, of, of your role in Iraq. I know there's a discussion of corruption, but uh, we have a number of different functions within government that are, uh, that are overseeing that. For you, as Secretary of State, the, these provincial reconstruction teams, some which provide technical expertise for agriculture or, or clean water, very, or, or build roads, uh, we've seen wonderful things that have come about with my colleague from Massachusetts, uh, Mr. Tierney and I, and uh, my colleague from Minnesota, Ms. McCollum, uh, when we were in Afghanistan. Uh, some really uh, community-changing opportunities 
uh, for regional reconciliation. And I know the Jones Commission had uh, a lot to say about um, that localized reconciliation and building that up in order to, to strengthen the national spirit. Um, the provincial reconstruction teams, I think, are a key uh, part of what you and the State Department are trying to add, the so-called diplomatic surge. With the security issues um, being actually less of a potent political force for some here in Congress, with that being resolved, can you discuss with me, if you can just uh, take a moment or two, um, and talk about the, the value and importance of the pro provincial reconstruction teams and the, 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 the work that you're putting into building those and getting those out in a timely manner. The gentleman's time uh, has expired, but we'll get an answer. Thank you. In 2005, uh, we, late 2005, we began to deploy these provincial reconstruction teams, which allows us to work at the local level, the provincial level, and therefore to multiply our points of success because um, the delivery of goods and services to populations really can't take place out of Baghdad. And so we began with provincial reconstruction teams in places like Mosul, uh, which were able to work with local government. And they do not just uh, delivery, but they really do help to build the capacity of local governments and provincial governments. They help with budget uh, execution. They help get resources from Baghdad down to um, the provinces. I, I want to reiterate it's a country that doesn't really still to this day have a functioning electronic banking system and so moving funds is difficult. Uh, but what it, what it has allowed us to do is to build from the bottom up. Now we thought that this was working very well but that we could make it better and so I've worked with uh, Secretary Gates and with the military and we've now embedded people into brigade command teams and they really have become one. We talk with them frequently. They go into very dangerous circumstances, but they go down to provincial level in places like Anbar and Baghdad neighborhoods, and they work with local governments to, to uh, deliver services. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Sarbanes. Thank you, Secretary Stanton. Secretary Rice, thanks for being here. Um, I wanted to call your attention to the report of the outside panel that you convened um, and its conclusions, which are in stark contrast to some of the statements that were made by uh, officials of the State Department. So let me begin by going over some of those statements and then we can look at the report's conclusions. On October 1st, I mean just recently, your spokesman made this statement. The State Department is, quote, scrupulous in terms of oversight and scrutiny not only of Blackwater but of all our contractors. I would strongly dispute anyone's assertion that the State Department has not exercised good and strong oversight in our efforts to manage these contractors. On September 27th, your deputy, Ambassador John Negroponte, said that every single incident in which Blackwater fires its weapon is, quote, reviewed by management officials to ensure the procedures were followed. And on October 2nd, Ambassador Richard Griffin, who is the Assistant Secretary of State for Diplomatic Security, testified before this committee that every time a weapon is fired by a security guard, an investigation is triggered. Were those accurate statements made by those officials? Um, the reason that I ordered a bottom-up review was that I wanted to be certain about what was actually going on in terms of oversight. That's why I told people that I wanted a probing 360-degree review. Uh, I'm sure you, you understand, Congressman Sarbanes, that um, you are in a large organization like the State Department. Uh, when issues come, the most important thing to do is to get to the bottom of what's going on and then to fix the problems. And so that's why I ordered the panel, because I wanted to be sure that indeed we were carrying out oversight as scrupulously as we could. Well, I think the report demonstrates that we were not. And it's a good thing you ordered the, the report. Therefore, I made the changes. Yeah. It's a good thing you ordered the report because these were high-level officials who were apparently totally out of touch with what was in fact happening. Let me read three conclusions of Ambassador Kennedy's report. The first one, when incidents involving the discharge of weapons occur, the scope of investigation has not been broad enough to ensure that on-the-scene information is gathered quickly and thoroughly. Second conclusion. The embassy process for addressing incidents, including those involving the U.S. military, is insufficiently comprehensive. Third, the process for coordinating and sharing of information between the embassy and the multinational force 
in Iraq is not sufficiently robust to ensure knowledge of the particulars of incidents that could potentially affect U.S.-Iraqi relations. So the report that Ambassador Kennedy uh, made is very clear that the State Department's oversight of Blackwater and these other contractors I, was seriously deficient. I am the one who ordered the report because I, I believe when you are managing an organization and uh, you have a situation like we had, you, you owe it to your people in the field and to the country to have a full 360 degree look at what is going on, to have a full look by people, by the way, who are independent of the department including General Jalwan and Ambassador Roy, and to then act on those recommendations. But frankly, after the uh, Blackwater incident, I did not, could not myself say that I knew that our oversight was adequate, and that is why I ordered the report. And the report reached some of the conclusions that I just um, enumerated. I am trying to understand how these officials, as recently as late September, in early October, who are high-level people who pre presumably have access to the very kinds of sources of information that the panel looked at, could be saying publicly that everything was fine, that there was good scrutiny and good oversight. And what I am trying to understand is, were they speaking just because they didn't have any information or facts, or were they trying to mislead the Congress or the no, public? I mean, what was no, happening? No one was trying to mislead you, uh, Congressman. I do think that what, uh, what that people were in asking those responsible, do you have appropriate oversight? The answer was yes, we have appropriate oversight. What I then did, because I could not say without uh, qualification or without concern that there was appropriate oversight, was to have people go and look thoroughly at the situation. You might note that that panel interviewed many, many tens of people that, for instance, John Negroponte would not have interviewed. So in, when he made those statements. So when you have a management problem, the way to fix it is to have a thorough 360 degree look at it by independent people and then to act on their recommendations. Well, I appreciate your admitting that there was a management problem within the State Department. And I am curious to know whether you regret the failures of the Department to conduct the kind of oversight of these outside contractors that appears to have occurred. And Congressman, whenever there is a um, an incident of this case, of this sort, um, I consider it my responsibility both to acknowledge it and to try and fix it. That wasn't my question. My question was whether you regret the failures of your department, whether you regret your failures I, I to conduct oversight I of these I contractors. Certainly, I certainly regret that uh, we did not have the kind of oversight that I would have insisted upon. We now will have that oversight. But it is our responsibility as managers to recognize that when there is a problem, you need to investigate that problem thoroughly and then you need to act to fix it. I appreciate your time indicating your closed. regret. Thank you. Ms. Fox. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, I think you are, you, you certainly have earned the respect that you have uh, from both sides of the aisle for your straightforwardness and your ability to um, answer questions. And I, I admire you tremendously. So thank you very much for being here. Um, we've established that corruption is, has been a serious problem in Iraq, and you've said that yourself several times. Um, we've also heard about some of the steps the government's taking to fight corruption in Iraq, ranging from the military surge to the diplomatic efforts. I'm going to ask you three questions and let you answer them all at one time, if that's okay. Um, and you know we've been called for votes again. <laughs> Would I be correct in saying that our assistance in fighting corruption is a long-term effort? That's the first one. And when do you think we'll see the results of this long-term effort? At what point will we do that? And are there any lessons that we can learn from our experience helping factions in Northern Ireland and the Balkans work through peaceful coexistence that some thought would never see peace? Well, yes, it's a long effort. It is a country that has been through uh, war and dictatorship. And uh, yes, it's a long effort to fight the corruption. 
I can't give you an exact date, but I know that the Iraqis uh, are making efforts to improve the circumstances there. Some of the things that will help, for instance, when they get a system that is less dependent on subsidies, there will be less uh, possibility for corruption. Part of it comes out of that system. And so we'll continue to work with them. Uh, yes, we've seen in the Balkans, by the way, where corruption is still a problem, uh, we have seen that uh, it takes people time to reconcile. But I just want to repeat, I don't know what the implication is of uh, saying that, yes, Iraq, I, I do not th think that the implication of saying that Iraq has a corruption problem is to say that that is therefore reason for the United States to stop dealing with the Iraq uh, government or working to help them fight their corruption problems. It's too important to our security, and uh, that's why we're going to continue to help them to fight the corruption. Mr. Chairman, if I could, I'd like to. I'd like to tell the Secretary one little story. Two years ago, I was at the Louisville Elementary School speaking to a group of second graders. Uh, and we actually were having lunch together, second graders. And uh, I asked them if they had any questions they'd like to ask me. And there was a little girl there who said to me, well, since President Bush cannot run for reelection, do you think that Secretary of State Rice might run? I think she'd make a great president. <laughs> so I want you to know Thank the you. second graders in Louisville are fans of yours. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fox. Uh, Mr. Braley. Good morning, Secretary Rice. Good morning. I want to talk to you about the Christmas Eve shooting on December 24th of 2006. According to documents that the committee has obtained, a Blackwater employee who was drunk shot and killed a security guard for the Iraqi vice president inside the protected green zone in Baghdad. This didn't happen on a, on a mission protecting diplomats. It happened on a Christmas Eve after a party inside the green zone. And if this shooting had happened here in the United States, there would have been an arrest, a criminal conviction, and a prosecution. And if one of our soldiers serving in Iraq had engaged in this type of behavior, they would have faced a court martial under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. But according to what the committee has determined, this is what the State Department did. It flew the contractor out of Iraq within 36 hours. Then it asked Blackwater to make a payment to the family. And according to the emails that we have been provided with, a payment to the families was considered and then, quote, the best way to assure that the Iraqis don't take the steps, such as telling Blackwater that they are no longer able to work in Iraq. And my simple question to you is, as we head toward another Christmas Eve, do you agree that the State Department made a mistake in responding to that incident? First of all, that incident has been, or that uh, circumstance has been referred to the Justice Department. And uh, I've testified here that there is a lacuna in the law, and we are working to get appropriate, uh, we would like to get appropriate legislation that speaks to the uh, prosecution of civilian contract personnel uh, working uh, in circumstances like Iraq. That was one of the findings of the uh, panel that I sent out. And in fact, we very much would like to see that because you are right. The Uniform uh, Code of Military Justice provides a context for um, our soldiers. And uh, there is protection inside the United States. We believe there is a lacuna and it needs to be filled. When we had the CEO of Blackwater, Eric Prince, sitting in the exact chair that you're sitting in right now, I went through this with him, and he told the committee under oath that, in his opinion, all Blackwater employees were already subject to the Uniform Code of Military Justice, the War Crimes Act, and other international uh, accountabilities that our current military is subject to. And then I went through the individual statutes with him, and he seemed to admit that if you look at the language of those statutes, they don't, in fact, apply unless they are accompanying U.S. military personnel. I, I agree. And that's why we are seeking uh, and working for legislation. And uh, we're very happy to work with anyone who, who would like to, to get that legislation. There is a lacuna in our law about this. And uh, even though this particular case, I want to reiterate, has been referred to the Department of Justice for their action, we believe that there is a hole. The House recently passed legislation addressing this very issue. Have you taken a public position on the merits of that uh, legislation? We uh, believe that there are some problems in that particular House law, but we are prepared to work uh, to get a law 
uh, working with the Senate and working with the House to get a law that we think addresses the problem. Are you prepared today to identify the specific problems that you have with the legislation? Uh, I, I think we should allow the discussions that are going on that are being led, as these are by the Justice Department, to, um, to get that law. But I'm very strongly supportive of a law that would uh, close this loophole. How do you square your support for that concept of this legislation with the White House's stated public opposition to the legislation? Because the specific legislation uh, has a number of problems and concerns from the point of view not just of those who would have to operate in the field, but also the Justice Department. And of course, it is the Justice Department that uh, advises the President on uh, this kind of matter. Uh, this same email we were referring to, which was actually sent out by Margaret Scobie from Baghdad the day after the incident in question on Christmas Eve, says, will you be, doing, be following up in Blackwater to do all possible, sure, all possible to assure that a sizable compensation is forthcoming? Are you aware of the actual compensation that was paid to the family of this Iraqi I'm security I'm not aware guard? of the actual amount in this case. I, I don't believe it. I can't recall it at this point, but I, I will. Uh, say, Congressman, that this, this uh, process or this practice of compensation is uh, something that is used. Uh, it's a part of a kind of cultural norm, and it is used. Are you used by us and used <clears throat> by the military. Are you aware that the Charge d'Affaires had recommended a payment of $250,000 and that the actual settlement was $15,000? I know that there was a significant difference in what was recommended and what was done. Do you agree that $15,000 is not a sizable compensation? I'm, I'm not going to second guess the decision at the time, uh, Congressman, because I was not uh, on the spot and I didn't review all of the factors that might have been taken into account. But the the practice of compensation, of course, is one that uh, is used uh, fairly broadly in, in the region. It seems yep. that if this government is paying $1,222 a day to Blackwater for the services of its employees, that a compensation of $15,000 for the life of an Iraqi who is guarding the Vice President of Iraq seems like a very meaningless compensation. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Hodes? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Madam Secretary, I, I'd like to uh, pick up on one of the issues that you've just discussed. You, you said you now see that there is a hole in the law and you would very much like to see legislation. On Tuesday, your Blue Ribbon panel investigating the use of security contractors in Iraq issued its report. And as you've indicated, one of its principal findings is particularly troubling. It doesn't simply say there's a hole. What it says is, that the legal framework for providing oversight over personal protective service contractors is inadequate in that the panel is aware of any basis for holding non-Department of Defense contractors accountable under U.S. law. I find this an amazing statement. And while we can acknowledge that we need to fix it, I'm very curious about how we could have possibly gotten into this situation. Ambassador Kennedy's panel, in effect, found that Blackwater and the other security contractors have been acting above the law, essentially in free space, above the law. In this country, no one is above the law. Yet the contractors, according to your panel, have been above the law for the past four years. How could this happen? You've paid Blackwater over $800 million didn't anyone, didn't you or your subordinates ever stop to ask whether or not the legal framework was in place to hold these contractors accountable for its actions? The military certainly is when there is error committed. How could this have happened? Uh, first of all, this is not just a problem um, for State Department contractors. We have a lot of contractors working in Iraq, and we want to make sure there is a proper framework. But I don't think that it is proper to say that they were above the law. I have just told you that one of the, that the case that was just uh, referenced has, in fact, been referred to the Justice Department. So it is not above the law. It is being handled by the Justice Department. We continue to believe that the tightening of that framework uh, would make a, a great deal of sense, and we want to work for that legislation. But that case, the case of Christmas Eve, has indeed been referred to the Justice Department. Um, we have heard graphic testimony and seen convincing evidence that over the past four years there have been numerous, numerous incidents by Blackwater, 
which arguably could constitute criminal behavior under United States law, yet there has not been a single prosecution brought by the Justice Department. I'm aware of no previous FBI investigations or any action by the State Department to hold Blackwater accountable for any of the previous incidents involving arguably unwarranted violence against Iraqis. You now come and say there's a hole in the law and that the Justice Department is handling this matter. If, in fact, there is currently no legal framework under which the Justice Department and the FBI, if it finds something wrong was committed, could handle the matter, how do you explain to the American people and this panel that in the four years no proper legal framework has been put in place until apparently your, now, your, your support today for some legislation to handle these matters. This is an issue of prosecution under U.S. law. I would note that this, um, the framework in Iraq for dealing with the contractors comes from a period, uh, the CPA period, in which uh, Order 17 governed this. Um, it isn't adequate for the current circumstances. The case in uh, the case of the um, the Christmas circumstances have been referred to the Justice Department. I would remind that this is a war zone, and that it is true that sometimes uh, incidents happened. They are reviewed. It's not the case that they haven't been reviewed, but we do believe that it would be very helpful to have a law that is explicit to this particular circumstance. Madam Secretary, with all due respect, I think it's questionable whether anything that the CPA did had, in fact, binding authority on the United States legal system. And beyond that, I'm not talking about simply the Christmas incident. I'm talking about the confidence that we need to have that going forward, the State Department is going to take care of something which it appears that you and your subordinates have absolutely recklessly failed to do in the past four years, given the history of what is either incompetence in management or purposeful lack of attention to this, how can we be assured that we are going to be going forward in the right way to establish a legal framework that works to hold these contractors accountable? Well, first of all, Congressman, in this war zone, I don't think that people have been either reckless nor have they been trying somehow to shield people in this circumstance. What has happened is that we have been, uh, we have taken incidents, they've looked at them, they've reported them. But I would be the first to say, and it was my answer to Congressman Sarbanes, that the reason that I ordered this review is that I did not think personally that I could say that the oversight and the follow-up was appropriate. And so we now have a report on which we can act. We will act on it. We've already acted on some elements of it. It will be very helpful to have a law that closes this particular lacuna. But the uh, people in the field have been dealing with these circumstances under the most difficult circumstances where they're trying to protect our diplomats, and that they have done. They've been able to protect our diplomats, and I hope they will continue to be able to protect our diplomats who travel through war zones with IEDs going off and with indirect fire. But the framework indeed was inadequate, and that's why I've asked, asked for the review, and that's why I've asked that we put in place these particular recommendations. My time Gentlemen's is up. I find your answer unpersuasive. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has ex expired. I just want to point out the incident was not in a war zone. It was in the green zone, and it was a man who was drunk on a Christmas Eve and who shot uh, uh, the, the, the bodyguard Chairman, I said for the that one, has, that one has been referred to the, um, to the Justice Department. But again, Chairman, I'd encourage you to go and look at the, the green zone Chairman, can be pretty tough, too. Could the gentleman yield just for a second? The, gre the green a zone can be pretty tough. Could the yeah. gentleman just yield for yes. a, a, a I'd like to point out that there appears to have been no witnesses. So when I spoke to the Justice Department, oh. the problem is they have a hard time reconstructing it because there are no witnesses. And just secondly, I'd like to point out that 30 Blackwater personnel have died defending uh, the State Department and other officials who travel around Iraq, and they've never failed once in their protection, whoever they've been required to protect. Well, yes. they, they, uh, it's, I want to go on to other members, but there's no law in effect. The man got drunk, shot an, an, an innocent Iraqi, not during a war, but in the green zone on Christmas Eve, 
and he can't even be prosecuted because there's no law in effect. So uh, that's the situation Chairman, we're faced with there. Chairman, I think what there. Mr. Shea said to you is actually correct. The Justice Department is looking to see whether he can be prosecuted by, because of the evidence. It is not the absence of law in that case. It's a question of evidence. Yes. So they, they are investigating it. Thank you. Ms. McCollum. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Secretary Rice, on July 26, 2007, this committee held an oversight hearing on the problems with the State Department's construction of the new uh, $600 million embassy in Baghdad. General Williams, the head of the State Department Office of uh, Overseas Building Operations, testified that there were no significant problems. The head of the State Department's Office of Over Seas building operations testified that there were no significant problems with the construction at the embassy and that it would be completed in September. And I'm going to quote to you what he said. Quote, I am pleased to report, Mr. Chairman, that the project is on schedule, on budget, and we're slated to complete the project in September of this year. And then he goes on to say, we have received numerous accolades as to the extremely high quality of the construction. I would like to continue on, though, that in September, when General Williams promised the building would be ready, the State Department inspectors issued a report on the, on the embassy's fire suppression system. They documented hundreds of violations of the contract specifications, fire codes, and regulations. At yesterday's hearing before the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee, you said we've all experienced problems with construction suggesting that the problems in the Baghdad embassy were nothing out of the ordinary. I'd like to um, show you a copy of this 140-page report and read to you just a few of the excerpts. Quote, the fire service mains are defective. Quote, there is no reliable fire sprinkler system coverage in any building. Another quote. A fire could spread very quickly from one area to another, and I read the report, and that's because the proper materials are not put in between the firewalls. Another problem, improper wiring methods used throughout the building. The entire insulation is not acceptable, is another quote. And the final one I'll use is the contractor could not provide a timeline for completion and continues to struggle with the understanding of project specifications. And in fact, in one of the minutes, a Mr. Thorpe asked the attendees, who will take responsibility if a fire occurs? The underground breaks, and they're talking about the main pipeline, cannot supply water to the fire. And in the minutes, it says, there was no response. Many of these problems were known long before the July hearing. For example, the report says a year ago the State Department was informed that the contractor used the wrong materials on underground fire service mains and they've already started to crack. It's very hard for me to reconcile the testimony the committee received in July, which promised the embassy would open in September with an inspection report and the documents with scores of serious construction problems, problems of life, health, and safety. So could you please explain to this committee why we were told in July that this embassy would be open in September? Well, General um, Williams did uh, testify that the embassy would be ready in September, but obviously if there were flaws and defects at all, we weren't going to open it under those circumstances. The problems that you're referring to Congresswoman McCollum, are indeed problems that the State Department found itself. These were problems found by the uh, Office of Overseas Building's own fire inspectors. And so, of course, when those were found, the remediation had to be done at the expense of the contractor, and so it delayed uh, bringing the building online. So, yes, these are, these are problems in construction. They were found by the, um, our own inspectors. They're being remediated by the Ma company. Ma Madam, Madam Secretary, the State Department was aware of the problems that I just cited, aware of the problems before the July meeting. Uh, General Williams came to this committee and told us that the construction was of extremely high quality. 
and he told us that this embassy would open in September. Now, given the magnitude of the problems and many of them that the State Department was aware of well before this hearing, it would be uh, not good if uh, your staff did not know in July when coming before this committee that this building had such serious problems. That's a huge communication problem in the State Department or a deliberate communication problem in the State Department before those who came to testify to this committee. Now, Mr. Chair, I also have a question for you. We were, we had asked for documents. This committee had asked for documents. We have received some of them, but my understanding is three months later, we have still not received the bulk of documents we requested at that hearing. Is that correct, Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, it is. Mr. Chair, I would, I know that you're asking for them. Um, we were told in other cases the documents would be made available. Obviously, building inspection reports are not uh, classified at this level for repair and construction, and I would hope the committee could receive everything. Uh, thank you. Uh, Secretary, I, I, I assume like you would assume that, too. Uh, well, I would like to respond, um, sure. Congressman. First of all, again, um, in construction, complex construction in a complex environment, uh, there were problems with the fire suppression system in the guardhouse. Those problems are being remediated at no cost to uh, the United States or to the taxpayer by the company on the basis of inspections that we ourselves did. I think anybody is familiar that when you take ownership of a construction project, you go and you find out what is wrong and then the company remediates. That's what is going on here. It's a completely normal practice. The circumstances of Iraq are anything but normal. But Thank we are not going to accept a building that these problems have not Thank been dealt with. Thank you, on Secretary. The, on, yes. the, yes. on the documents, yes. um, um, as I understand it, we have 18 separate substantive requests. We have uh, exerted 10,000 man hours in trying to fulfill those requests. In one case, Mr. Chairman, the request uh, was one that globally would have brought about a million documents into a million pages of documents uh, in. So it takes time, uh, Congresswoman. I have a staff of people working as hard as they can to make those documents available to you. They are career people. They are not political people. They are trying to make them available to you. Um, I can, if you would like, uh, assign an officer from some other high priority task to try and do this full time. I am prepared to do that. But I can tell you that the document requests have been um, quite extensive, and we are doing everything that we can to get the documents to well, you. Well, I, I uh, want to have cooperation and want to be also be reasonable with you. I must tell you, your department has been the most difficult to get documents from. We have worked with other departments of government as well. We are the watchdog committee. These are government, uh, government spending taxpayers' funds, and uh, we think we are entitled to get that information. It is certainly not national security for us to know how the money is being spent on the building. As I said, we will get the documents to you, uh, Mr. Chairman. It is not that we are not trying to get the documents to you, but the requests are quite extensive. I appreciate that. Uh, Ms. Maloney. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Madam Secretary, thank you for your service. In, in your opening statement, uh, you said that our troops deserve the best support. And I couldn't agree more. And, in fact, uh, part of that support was supposed to be training the Iraqi police so that they could stand up, as the President would say, stand up so our troops can stand down and come home. Because of this focus and mission, and because it is so important uh, to, to our Iraqi mission, I was incredibly disturbed to read the report from uh, Stuart Bowen, the special IG for, for Iraqi construction this week. And in his report, he said that the State Department's $1.2 billion contract with DynCorp uh, to train the Iraqi police is missing. He said, and I quote, uh, the State Department does not know specifically what it received from most of the $1.2 billion in expenditures under the DynCorp contract for the Iraqi police training program. He further called it, and I quote, the weakest staffed most poorly overseen large-scale program in Iraq. In February, he testified before this committee that $4.2 million was spent for an Olympic-sized pool in a palace for the Iraqi police 
and it has never been used. He called the program in complete disarray. And I repeat, this was one of our most vital focuses. So how do you, how do you respond to his uh, a scathing, a scandalous report? Well, first of all, uh, it is simply not true that we don't have a copy of the contract. We have a copy of the contract. He did, you have the contract. He says $1.2 million we, dollars we is floating around I, I in ether Congresswoman that it's missing. I think you said we don't have a copy of the contract. Let me just correct the record. We have a copy of the contract. Now, he said the money's missing. Now, let, no, mm -hmm. the, the money has to be reconciled. Now, let me explain to you what happened with INL and the Steincorp contract. When I became secretary, uh, there had been during the transition considerable concerns about how INL was being run and staffed. Uh, the first change that I made They, they told uh, us in a staff briefing they could not find the contract file. Uh, I'm told that, uh, let me explain, there is, we have the contract and the so contract you found it. file, mm -hmm. the con mm -hmm. there was not a contract file kept by the person who oversaw th saw this at the time. But I need to go back here just a moment, uh, Congresswoman. When I became secretary, I knew that there were problems in INL. One of the first personnel changes that I made was to uh, have a new assistant secretary for INL. I brought in a senior manager who did an internal audit of INL's operations, including over contracts of this kind, found sufficient uh, difficulties so that the incoming Assistant Secretary, Ambassador Ann Patterson, who had a lot of experience with this, having been ambassador in Columbia when we ran large police contracts, uh, then began, it had another external review and then began to remediate the problems so, so in So what INL. was your response to the $1.2 billion the, missing? It, you will see from the uh, report that Stuart Bowen has is that uh, since mid-2006 when Ann Patterson established appropriate mm -hmm. reconciliation measures for reconciling invoices and services, that that is completely accounted for. We have four people now working on the previous time to well, reconcile those we have well, already. Well, Madam Secretary, I'm, I'm going to contact tomorrow uh, the IG Bowen and ask him to give us another report since you seem to say it's all right now. Uh, no, but furthermore, uh, Secretary, if I could. Uh, Congresswoman, please could I, don't can, I, can I tell you that I am not surprised at the report that came out from uh, General Jones where he said the national police are ineffective and, he, and, he, and I want to quote this because I find it almost unbelievable. He said, the national police should be disbanded and reorganized. And I am not surprised given the fact that the money that was supposed to train them are missing. My question, M Madam Secretary, is for you to put yourself in my shoes. I'm home in my district. I'm standing in front of a town hall meeting of hardworking American men and women who are paying their taxes, many of them punch a clock for their time, they're accountable for their time and for their money, and how do I explain that the IG says that $1.2 billion is missing that was supposed to train the police, the most critical of our missions to help stand up, and well, how do I explain well, $4.2 million dollars for a swimming pool that has never been used? What do I say to my constituents when they say, why are American young men and women being killed when the American government cannot even account for the money to train the Iraqi police that is supposed to help them bring stability? General lady's uh, time has expired. Yes, would, the you Secretary like my, would you like my response, respond. Chairman? First of all, uh, Congresswoman, it is not right to say that $1.2 billion is simply missing. There is a process that needs to take place of the reconciliation of invoices which were considered inadequate. And so, in fact, goods and services have been delivered. We deliver the goods and services to Minsticky on the military side. They do the training. But the, uh, and so the training is not actually a State Department function. Our function is to administer the contract. Now, as to the but contract. But it was a State Department dollars and a State Department a contract. The State the contract, Department should be accountable. Uh, would you like me to? Yeah. complete my answer. Thank mm -hmm. you. Let me read for, to you from Stuart Bowen's uh, account. The Bureau has taken action, meaning the INL. The Bureau has taken action and continues to take actions to improve its contract management in general and its management of the DynCorp contract in particular. As, uh, as a result, we have, in the reconciliation process that has been taking place, 
already identified some 20 plus million dollars that uh, we've billed, the 29 million dollars that we've billed the company for because the invoices were inadequate. There is another 19 million dollars that is being pursued with the company. We expect to find more. So there is a reconciliation process going on. You can tell your constituents this is not a matter of having lost the money. This is a matter of invoices, as I am told by the people who are doing this. This is a matter of invoices and uh, records that were not solid enough for us to be confident that the goods and services were being billed properly. Therefore, we put four people on reconciling contracts prior to mid-2006. We are up to date on reconciling those after mid-2006. So that is the story. And I want to again note that Seeger didn't find this. This was a Department of State audit of its own procedures that came under new management because there were problems in the Bureau of INL. And that's very often the case with many of the things that have been mentioned here. It is the Department that finds problems and then seeks to fix them. Madam Secretary, yes. um, you, 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 we are trying to accommodate your schedule and uh, it was our understanding you want to leave at 1230. We have four members who would still like to ask you questions who have been here all day. Uh, I, I wonder if you could stay uh, that extra time, 15, 20 minutes. Um, uh, I have a, a really uh, very important meeting. I can perhaps the members, if the members can keep their questions short and I can answer all of them at the end, perhaps so, that would be uh, the best. How would, may we do three minutes each member Fine. and then you will have a chance to respond to the Perfect. members' questions? Let me ask uh, the members if that is acceptable. I am deferring to. Uh, I, I would like my colleague to have five minutes to ask his question. Well, I would like my colleagues to have five well, minutes so as well. So it is not acceptable. Oh, it is not acceptable. So uh, then the question to you is will you stay a little longer so we can accommodate a few more members? Yeah. Yes, Chairman. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, Mr. Jordan. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary, thank you for your service to our country and the, and the professional way you go about your duties. Uh, let me ask a general question. If I have any time left, I want to I want to leave some uh, to uh, my, my colleague from Connecticut. Uh, what impact do you think uh, actions and statements by members of Congress have had on, had on your ability to deal with corruption in Iraq and, and maybe more importantly to uh, to hurt our chances of succeeding in our mission. And I am thinking specifically of statements like made by members of Congress when they talked about a slow bleed on denying dollars to our troops. I am thinking about members of Congress who have talked about a public timetable, a date where we announced to the end, a date we are going to leave the field, un 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 unprecedented. Uh, statements by members of Congress who talked about the war is lost. Um, and in and, and actions uh, recently where 79 members of Congress voted not to condemn an organization that um, Slandered the reputation of a 30-year veteran and, and a, a four-star general. Could, could you could you comment on that, uh, if you would, please, Secretary? Well, um, I people can say what they would like, but I think for the morale of our people in the field, what is important is for people to recognize and to say that they know that they are giving their service to their country under the very most difficult circumstances. That they, these State Department people who are being talked about uh, for programs that are trying to do this but may not be fully achieving that are people who are serving uh, far away from family under extremely difficult circumstances, uh, dodging indirect fire in order to carry out these, uh, these goals. And um, I think the service ought to be honored. And I appreciate that you have made that comment. Thank you. I, I would yield the balance of my time to Thank you. Um, there has been information that e Excuse me for a minute. Uh, may I ask? Uh, all of the members that still have time uh, that they hope to have to ask questions, that they keep it as short as possible. Mr. Shays has talked three times, and Mr. Shays, you certainly have a right to speak. No, no, but uh, you're going. I don't want you to deprive other members well, no, or the secretary of her statement. Why schedule. I want the full five minutes? Well, you're on your five minutes. No, well, thank you. Uh, we have had incredible misinformation provided to the secretary, and we've had a number of Democrats who've gone one after the other. Uh, and I'd like to make sure that we are clear on this. Does any of the 96 million billion dollars that is appropriated by the United States go to the Iraqi government? It does. It, it goes to programs, uh, either programs on the State Department side, or to fund our troops and our diplomats in the field and our operations in the field. Thank That's you. what it's for, not for the Iraqi government. The second question I want to ask you: uh, with The gentleman yield just yes. quick. Does that mean of the 96 billion then? 
if we're spending it on that, does it could any of that then end up with Iraqi corruption or end up in enemy's hands as has been alleged it, on the other side? It is going to fund our troops and fund our diplomats and fund our embassy operations and fund programs that we run. So that couldn't end up in enemy hands as has been alleged over here, could I, it? I, it would be difficult to see Thank how. Thank you. And that's the reason why we're trying to ask these questions. The other question that uh, Ms. McCullough uh, has uh, constantly asked, it was your report that uncovered the problems with the embassy. Is that not correct? That is correct. And it is based on your report, you have taken action to make sure that the contractor fixes it, correct? That is correct. And is it true that you will not take a possession of this property until they are corrected? That is correct. Yeah. Let me just ask you about uh, uh, Blackwater. Blackwater, I'd like to know uh, how many Blackwater soldiers, uh, first off, I'd like to know the makeup of the individuals that uh, comprise the, the, uh, the guard, the, the security force. It's my understanding they are former military personnel, either Army, Marines, Air Force, SEALs, uh, these, that's my understanding. Is that correct? That is correct. And they are people who are thoroughly vetted, even despite the fact that they have significant security experience and have most often served in our own um, armed forces or the like. They are still vetted beyond that and, given, and have to be a vetting to have secret security clearances. It's also my understanding that, um, that there have been 30 Blackwater Army, police, border, uh, excuse me, Army, police, Navy, SEALs, whatever, now under Blackwater's payment, that have lost their lives. Yes, that's correct. It's also my understanding that they have been in charge of protecting Americans. Have they lost any American that they were charged to protect? Uh, thank God and knock on wood, no. I find that absolutely astounding that they have not lost any in this war. And um, I just thank my colleague for yielding. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired, uh, Mr. Davis. Now let me uh, suggest, Mr. Davis, and Ms. Norton, and Mr. Cannon. I would hope that all three of you, if you don't feel you need to use your full five minutes, would re be uh, respectful of the secretary's schedule. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam oh. Secretary, let me just clarify something. Under responding to questions from Representative Maloney, did you just testify? that no contract file was kept for the $1.2 billion program? I said that the, um, the coordinator, the representative, did not keep a full contract file. That file is being reassembled. It is one of the reasons that I made a change in the management of that bureau, well, Mr. Thank Davis. You. Thank you very much. Um, I want to ask why the State Department selected first Kuwaiti as the prime contractor on the embassy project. The State Department awarded the $600 million embassy construction contract to first Kuwaiti in July and September of 2005. At the same time, the managing partner of the company, Wadi El Apsi, was apparently under investigation for paying kickbacks to procurement officials to obtain federal subcontracts for first Kuwaiti. I'd like to show you, this is a court document in my hand that the Department of Justice filed in May in a criminal case involving one of the officials whom Mr. L. Epsi apparently bribed. This official pleaded guilty to these charges. And let me just read some of the excerpts from the pleading. In or about June 2003, the managing partner offered to pay a kickback. Prior to the bid process for the subcontract, the managing partner paid approximately $10,000 as an advance on their kickback agreement. Under the kickback agreement, the official was to receive approximately $50,000 for awarding subcontract 167 to First Kuwaiti. Now, of course, the taxpayers, not only in my district, but across the country, will find this difficult to understand. The embassy project is the largest construction project in the history of the State Department. It is a crucial part of your long-term plan for Iraq. Yet the contracts were awarded to a company that is run by someone who is under investigation for kickbacks and bribing 
contract officials. Can this be justified? Do you think there's justification for this? Um, I believe that this is a sealed document. Am I right? Yes. Yes. Um, and we were therefore not aware of this justice action. But um, it has been unsealed. Uh, it yes, was a sealed after, document. After the, after the fact. I just want to yes. note that this is a sealed indictment. It was indeed a sealed indictment. All right. And so uh, we were not, in fact, aware of a sealed um, indictment against this official. Uh, you asked how Kuwait got the um, bid. Co First, Kuwait offered a firm fixed priced contract, and it was thus awarded the contract. Uh, many of elements were, were bid, but in fact, uh, it was awarded because it was a fixed price contract. And um, I want to repeat. We are uh, going to continue to inspect the product that is turned to us, turned over to us. We're going to continue to make sure that First Kuwait remediates any uh, problems at its own expense. Well, Madam Secretary, but, uh, let me but, no, we were not aware of this. All right. Well, let me just say that I don't think that a lack of information or ignorance of facts um, really can be an explanation. The contractor that Mr. L. Apsley apparently bribed is KBR, which at the time was a subsidiary of Halliburton. They had the single biggest government contract in Iraq. Halliburton reported the bribery to Army officials in 2003 and were, in fact, cooperating with the investigation. All that you or your staff had to do was ask the Army or the Justice Department about their experience with First Kuwaiti. I think you should have known that First Kuwaiti was implicated in serious corruption before you awarded the contract to the company. But assuming that you did not know the facts when the contract was awarded, you certainly and obviously know them now. Yet the State Department does not seem to be doing anything to separate itself from First Ku Kuwaiti. In fact, the State Department is actually awarding First Kuwaiti new contracts in Africa, Indonesia, and the Middle East. So my question really is, why are you continuing to award large contracts to First Kuwaiti when you know that the head of the company has been implicated in bribery? The gentleman's time has uh, expired. Yes, Secretary since Kuhn. this um, information has become available, uh, let me just say that the contract that um, we are aware of in JIDA, for instance, is actually to an American company, Grunley Walsh of Rockville, Maryland, for which First Kuwait is a prime, uh, a, a, a subcontractor. Now, um, I have asked that we review um, all of our contract um, possibilities with First Kuwait, and that review is underway. But these are new contracts. No, sorry, uh, Mr. Davis, your time has expired. Mr. Cannon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your indulgence uh, for the, the full time allotted and, uh, and uh, those others on the, the panel who wish to use their full time. And, and I want to thank you, Madam Secretary. I apologize for not having been here during this whole hearing. Uh, unfortunately, we've had other things to do, but I've watched you on TV, which re really is what counts. And uh, you've been calm and concise, um, hectored but unharried. Uh, and so I think to the American people, you've come across uh, very, very well. I want to thank you for your service. This is difficult. I was talking to a congressman on the way back from the last vote, and uh, I was just asking him, who wrote the book on what we're supposed to do? Because I haven't seen it yet, and then we're sort of struggling forward as, as we go. Uh, although I, we are we're dealing with something that is fairly unique in our history as Americans, and that is that one of our parties seems to be vested in our failure uh, in the, the war on terror in general, in, in Iraq in, in particular. And uh, I suspect the American people are going to figure that out. And your presence here today has been very, very helpful in helping them understand the sort of the complications uh, that we have. For instance, we have been talking about contractors under investigation, but you can't debar a contractor when he is under investigation, can you? That is right. And in fact, uh, what we rely on is a um, schedule that is provided um, from the, uh, from the uh, uh, GAO and the OMB that says that uh, this contractor is um, acceptable for 
bid, and unless they're on the barred list, then they can be acceptable for a bid. And uh, certainly, in circumstances in which something is sealed, uh, one wouldn't be expected to know that the just every single investigation that the Justice Department is going through. And, so and in yes, fact, they're not, they were not on the debarment list, to, to and, answer your and question. And an investigation would not put them on the debarment list. Now, ultimate That's conviction correct. would. We That's have a process correct. for that, but That's we correct. are a government of laws still, not of discretion unbridled, That's correct. as some would apparently wish to see. Now, I, I have a, a question that is really burning, because I have followed the issue closely with the uh, contract security. And, and I've argued with people here and in my home district uh, about the importance of this. It seems to me that, uh, in fact, both sides of the aisle here in Congress are saying we need to solve this problem diplomatically. And I think it takes more than just diplomacy. But it at least does take diplomacy. And we've had a record of no deaths of, di of diplomats under the protection of Blackwater in particular, but of other contractors. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how important the protection of diplomats has been in, in the process? Yes, first I want to repeat that, uh, thank God, and I, again, will knock on wood, we have not lost uh, people, and I think it is, uh, it's a <coughs> very good contract security that we've been provided. And uh, our people have to be able to get out of the green zone. They have to be able to function in ministries like the Ministry of Finance that's in the red zone. They have to be able to function in PRTs when we're not embedded with the military. They have to be able to get out and work with provincial councils. They, they have to be able to do all of that work. And without protection, I can't send unarmed diplomats out to do that. The military can't protect us. We don't have enough diplomatic security agents to protect us. So somebody's got to protect us. And that's what the private security firms do. Now, as I said, I think, I, I know that better oversight of these private security contractors is necessary. I'm the one who ordered the review. And having gotten the review, we are now acting on those uh, elements. But we cannot do our work. And for all of those who think, um, as the chairman began, that the political task now uh, is absolutely critical if we're going to uh, succeed in Iraq, the political task can't be done without uh, security for our diplomats. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I'm sort of wondering how if we armed our diplomats, how many innocent people might be killed by their inaccurate uh, aim? I think, I think that's not where we would want to go. I, I, I think that you're right, and I support you. And I'd like to yield uh, to Ms. Fox, who had a, a question. Um, Madam Secretary, um, I am very um, concerned about our relationship with Turkey and about what's happening with the PKK and their coming into Turkey and killing Turkish citizens. We've promised additional action and we've promised that we will stop these incursions into Turkey and yet the violence has increased. Can you tell us what we're going to be doing to stop this violence and stop the killing of Turkish citizens? Well, Time has expired, but please answer yes, that question. Which actually, it has not yet expired, Mr. Oh, it has now, and I yield back. I would hope that the gentlelady could respond to the no, question. No, I, I she asked a question. I think she's entitled to a response. We, but we have um, worked with the Iraqis and the Turks to put together a trilateral committee that tries to deal with these incidents. Uh, there will be a delegation of Iraqis in Turkey. We think that this is an opportunity for Iraqs and Turks to work together to try to deal with the PKK. Everybody believes that the PKK is a terrorist organization, so there isn't any uh, difference there. They operate in a very remote part of uh, Kurdistan, so it's very difficult uh, to, to completely root them out. But we uh, have been saying to the Turkish government that nothing is going to be gained by um, escalating the situation in um, an unstable environment. And so uh, thus far, we've been able to use diplomatic means. We've been able to use uh, promises and work together on intelligence sharing and information uh, to try to deal with the problem. Thank you, Madam Secretary. I'm going to, uh, we have three members. I'm going to set the clock at three minutes. You're entitled to five, but when you see it's expired, uh, see if you can wrap up. I'm not going to deny anybody their time. And, Madam Secretary, I'm going to give you the option of responding to whatever questions are asked in writing for the record so that we or, can move along. Or perhaps along. I can get all the questions and I can just respond at the end, Chairman. Uh, well, uh, let's, let's try it. Is that acceptable to those who have time? Ms. Watson, you're, you're the one who's next. Um, welcome again, Madam Secretary. Uh, 
about four and a half years ago, I asked someone from the State Department if we had planned on occupation and nation building, and the response was, that's absurd. So uh, the Baghdad Embassy is a $750 million project to build the largest embassy in the world, yet the man in charge of this project, James Golden, uh, has not laid eyes on it for the past five months. And the committee uh, interviewed Mr. Golden and his deputy, Mary French. And during the course of these interviews, we learned that Ambassador Crocker ordered Mr. Golden to leave Iraq in May. And uh, he basically uh, kicked him out of the country. And Mr. Golden has not been allowed to return since. And uh, we have learned that Mr. Golden was escorted off the embassy compound by armed guards. At our hearing in July, we asked Ambassador Kennedy about this, and he said that uh, Mr. Golden's expulsion from Iraq followed a discussion with Ambassador Crocker about operating procedures. And since then, we have been informed of the allegations that uh, Mr. Golden may have been expelled because he attempted to cover up uh, substandard work by the prime contractor, First Kuwaiti. And I understand that the report that has been referenced uh, has been unsealed for the last two years. And uh, the contractor, First Kuwaiti, after a martyr blew through a wall that was supposed to be blast resistant. So, uh, Secretary, can you provide us with any more information about why the head of this project, Mr. Golden, is now persona non grata in Iraq. Um, and let me just go through these questions oh, related sure. to that, uh -huh. and you can answer them all at the end or give the answers in writing. Uh, do you support uh, Ambassador Crocker's decision? And you can respond at the end. Uh, Mr. Golden acted in a manner that required him to be expelled from Iraqi under armed guard, we understand. And um, uh, yet, uh, was it inappropriate for him to continue managing a $750 million project, even though he can't actually go there and see it? And um, so I just want the State Department to clarify this. And uh, we're concerned about the cost of this major project. And um, I was told in the beginning that we don't plan to occupy, but it's going to be the largest embassy in the world. I believe there are 56 million people. Uh, in Iraq, and uh, we have a thousand people, and they're looking at employing five thousand. Do you want to take the other questions, and then I'll respond? However you wish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Watson. Uh, Ms. Norton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, uh, Secretary Rice, for for coming today. Uh, I have a, a question that. that uh, is, is essentially remedy oriented. Um, as I listen to testimony uh, in, in hearings before us about black water and about uh, corruption in Iraq, I kept thinking, well, you know, there's a ready made vehicle for this and agencies use it. And why wasn't it used here? I'm referring to the Inspector General. Uh, uh, the Inspector General at the um, uh, at the uh, State Department's Howard Krongard. Uh, and we have had very, very disturbing uh, testimony from many officials revealing very serious problems in, of all places, your IG's office. I mean, those are the people that expose the kind of corruption we have been looking at, that he has halted uh, investigations, censored reports, refused to cooperate even with law enforcement o o agencies such as the Justice Department. Uh, and even to pursue possibly criminal matters. I must say, since I've been in Congress, I've never heard of such allegations against a inspector general. Uh, I could detail some of this for you, but this comes from uh, people in uh, employees of the, the State Department uh, who have come forward uh, to, to testify about um, serious uh, problems in all three divisions of your IG office investigations. Uh, audit and inspections. Uh, I, I wonder if you uh, would be better served uh, by a, a vigilant IG which would have enabled you to move forward on some of these 
of problems yourself because it would have come from at least from within the administration and not and not uh, all of it from oversight hearings here in the here in the Congress. Uh, Mr. Murphy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for your patience, Secretary Rice. Um, I'll ask a fairly straightforward question, and it's in regards uh, not necessarily to the value of the services that we're getting, and there's been a lot of discussion here uh, in regards to that issue, but rather the profit that many of the companies, in particular the private companies that are operating in Iraq and Afghanistan, are taking out of these contracts. Uh, we had uh, Eric Prince, CEO of Blackwater, before uh, this committee several weeks ago, and his uh, answers in regards to questions and response to questions from Mr. Duncan and Mr. Welsh and I regarding the profit uh, that Blackwater is taking out of the contract, regarding his salary uh, as the head of a company that makes 90 percent of their money uh, off of. Um, government contracts. His answers were uh, very troublingly ev evasive. And uh, what we gleaned from that conversation, at the very least, was that Blackwater is potentially making uh, a 10 percent profit, which on one contract alone could be $85 million, that uh, Mr. Prince's salary uh, is potentially 10 times, maybe 20, 30 times as much as General Petraeus's salary is uh, for leading our troops uh, on the ground there. And I guess the question is very simple. Assuming that this uh, is an issue that you find concerning, uh, at the very least, don't you believe that this Congress and your department should have full disclosure of the profit that these private contractors are taking out of these contracts uh, and the compensation uh, that the executives of these companies are making? Uh, Madam Secretary, do you want to respond? Or yes. Do, uh, yes. Well, I, is that it? I think that's it. All right, fine. Then I will respond. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I will respond in writing to you, uh, Mr. Murphy, and uh, to uh, Ms. Watson, because there are uh, personnel issues involved here, and particularly concerning, uh, and by the way, Mary French is the uh, owner's representative, and she's the one who's on the ground all the time making sure that things are good with the project. So it's not that the project has not had oversight, uh, Congressman Watson, it's that uh, we did make an adjustment, but it's a personnel matter, and so I'll not, uh, not get into that. But if I'm uh, yes, if I may, though, I will, um, and also I'm, I'm obviously not um, competent to talk about Blackwater's uh, balance sheet, um, Congressman, but uh, I will uh, get back to you with the, the uh, spirit of your question. Um, now, perhaps I could use, however, Congresswoman Norton's um, to a question to make a point. Um, Howard Krongard has said that he wants very much to answer all the questions and allegations uh, that have been uh, put against him, and he will do that. Um, we've also asked uh, help from uh, the, um, the, um, the Committee on uh, Professional Integrity and Efficiency, which is an organization of senior IGs, and so we will uh, use their help. But I want to, to focus on something that you said, uh, Ms. Norton, which is that somehow the problems were discovered by the ins would have been discovered by the Inspector General. Overwhelmingly, the problems that have been identified here today have been discovered by the State Department in one way or another. Whether it is the DynCor issue concerning the police contract, where I made a change in that um, bureau when I first became secretary in which there were two internal investigations by the Department of Problems uh, of Contracting in that Bureau, in which there was then an outside review ordered by the Assistant Secretary, the new Assistant Secretary, to fully review the project management uh, in that Bureau. She came directly to me to say that she thought we had big problems in INL, and I uh, authorized her to fix them which is why the number of contract officers in INL uh, for this contract has been going up, why the number of contract officers in general has been going up. So that one was discovered by and being remediated by the department when Seeger uh, came into the picture. When it comes to uh, various problems in the embassy, uh, the $592 million part of the embassy, which was what was programmed when I became secretary in 2004, um, is being completed, uh, I'm told, on budget. Um, yes, there have been some problems in terms of getting it done on time. It is a difficult security environment in which convoys can't always get through. It is also the case that when some of the problems were identified by OBO's own inspectors, 
that the, the company is being given an opportunity to remediate those at the cost to the company and that once that remediation is done, there will be an external inspection by, um, by external actors of the work that they've done. So again, the Department's own processes found uh, these difficulties and has been remediating them. But not the, not the IG, and that, that's, that, that was really no, my question. In I, fact, I, I understand fact, that you've been able, and I congratulate you for what you've uncovered, but systematic review, failure to no, uh, but, but move forward with investigations would second. appear, would, just, would appear not to be maximum uh, use of the IG. Just a second. Uh, much has been done by the IG as well. It is to the IG that uh, then Acting Secretary Nancy Powell turned to get help on finding out what was wrong in INL. So the IG's office has, in fact, been very active, uh, Ms. Orton. Sometimes the IG is the way that we find these things. Sometimes it's management instinct, as it was for me when I thought there was a problem in INL and moved in the first week as secretary to deal with it. Sometimes it is a problem that comes up through an incident, as is the case with Blackwater. Sometimes it is a problem that is identified by a new management team coming into an area and says, you have a problem there, let's remediate it. But that's the nature of managing a complex organization, particularly when we are doing things like we're doing in Iraq in a time of war. So I just want to underscore that the Seeger process is one in which they go to our people to interview and to see what problems our people in the State Department identify. Uh, I have been very uh, well served by the Seeger process. I have a very good relationship with Stuart Bowen. I meet with him frequently, and we've cooperated with him frequently. But it would be incorrect to leave the uh, impression that somehow either the Oversight Committee or, for that matter, Seeger has uncovered problems that uh, in many cases but the not State the, Department But, but the Madam State Secretary, you have not so. been well served by your, your IG. And Mr. Chairman, I understand that we are going to have a, a separate hearing on the IG at, at, the, at, at, at the State Department precisely because so many issues have been raised yes, and need to be brought I just, out. I'd like to finish my, I think I was supposed to respond yes, uh, at the your, end. Your, your time to respond and yes. then uh, we're going to conclude the hearing. Thank you. So again, um, the IG wishes to respond to, respond to the allegations. We've asked for a referral of the case to this body. But, uh, how, but good management is not uh, relying on an IG to identify problems. Good management is having managers who identify problems. Good management is knowing when you sense that something is wrong, as I sensed with the Department of INL when I became secretary. That's why I cha made a change in leadership there. That's why I brought an experienced temporary head for that department who began, for that bureau who began the process of remediation. That's why I brought one of our most experienced ambassador who had police training experience in Colombia. She made major changes. And again, if you read the SIGA report, it notes that there have been considerable efforts made in that bureau to improve contract management oversight. And those efforts are going to continue. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm very glad to have had an opportunity uh, to report on the efforts the Department has made to deal with the <laughs> multiple ma management challenges. Well, Secretary Rice, I can't uh, thank you enough for your willingness to be here. And uh, no one on this committee, Democrat or Republican, uh, underestimates or, or minimizes the challenges that you face over a broad number of issues. I do want to tell you that um, the suggestion was made that those of us who are concerned about corruption in Iraq are for pulling out of Iraq if there's corruption in the Iraqi government. Our concern is that if there's corruption in the Iraqi government, then this government is not going to be able to have a, a political reconciliation. It's not going to get the support of its own people. It, in fact, is going to make it impossible for us to accomplish our goals in Iraq. And we did hear from several State Department people who told us that uh, fighting corruption was not only completely dysfunctional, but they, uh, the two State Department agencies actually boycotted each other's meetings. Uh, we did hear from Judge Roddy that 30 of his people, when they tried to deal with corruption internally in Iraq, were killed. And he had to leave and seek uh, refugee status in the United States. So if there's an epidemic of corruption, which is the term that was used by Stuart Bowen, uh, that is undermining political reconciliation, and he believes also that it's funding the terrorists. I think it's a concern that we both share, 
but I wouldn't want anybody to leave this hearing with the impression that those of us who are concerned about it are concerned about it because we want uh, to pull out of Iraq. I, I really appreciate that clarification, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think that's a very important point because we're going to have to work on this and fight it together. And if I may just renew uh, an invitation. I don't know when you were last in Iraq, but I think it would be uh, useful. I, I was there uh, of a couple of years ago, like and, I'll, and I'll be happy to go again. Perhaps you'll invite me to go with you. I Thank would enjoy you. the opportunity. Thank you. Mr. I'll, Davis? I need to go along make sure Henry's seeing the right <laughs> stuff. But, uh, Mr. Chairman, thanks for calling this hearing. Um, I think one, a couple of things this hearing has shown. Number one, U.S. tax dollars aren't going for terrorists. They aren't going being spent corruptly by an Iraqi government. The construction of the Iraqi embassy is a fixed price contract. And like all contracts, major construction contracts I have ever been associated with, there are punch list items that need to be completed on the contractor's tab. Um, that in point of fact, allegations, sealed indictments, uh, and, and so on, there have been no resolutions or no convictions on these. And under current code, under the current law, that is not a reason for debarment. Now, we can always revisit that if we want to do that. We tried the previous administration tried this under what was called blacklisting regulations, and they got repealed very, very quickly because they were found to be inoperable. But we can, we can have that debate. But what's happened here is the Secretary has followed the law. And um, I think that, can, as I said, that can be an issue for the committee down the road. But it is certainly outside the purview of the Secretary of State, who has followed the current law. In fact, what we have found is when agency heads step up to resolve issues outside the proverbial regulatory or statutory box, we are the first ones to call them up here and find out, find out why they didn't follow the law. Uh, Madam Secretary, you are doing the best that you can, and I think the question we should have asked you is how can we help you? What legal changes are needed to help you get a very, very difficult job done? You have requited yourself and the State Department well today, in my opinion, and I am proud of the job you are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We want to help you, but we also want you to help us do our job, which means give us the information we need to represent our constituents. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your willingness to do that. Thank you very that, much. That uh, completes our business. The committee stands adjourned. President Bush traveled to California today to survey the damage from the wildfires. We'll get an update on the President's trip 